the next session I'm, I'm going to have to go up to the podium to introduce. We have a speaker who is um, uh, in Europe at the moment and he's going to, we're going to allow him to go first since he is on Skype. He's going to do a Skype presentation and then we'll take the, the other speakers in that session. So if you'll just, if we could ask for the first session speakers to come up. Um, uh, Siegfried, I don't know, yes. Uh, Siegfried uh, Livana, Samantha Ashman, uh, Abrak Pollitt we have on there, and uh, Bernard Doubled. Thank you. We, we're going to start off with Babrak Ibrahimi from the University of East Anglia. Um, his current research is into the areas <clears throat> of possibilities of political action. He is a philosopher um, by training. He's interested in Carl Schmitt's The Concept of the Political as appropriated by the left in Europe and its presence in the work that intuitively stand in contrast to that concept, for example, Hannah Arendt's conception of the, pos of the political. Um, he is, is going to try and pull together these in a convergence of these opposed theorists, Schmitt and Arendt, um, who he argues nevertheless share some essential elements. Um, he's changed it somewhat, but the title of his paper is Humanity and the Liberal Era. Um, we're just going to pick him up on Skype. Okay, over to you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, I'm going to um, make a very brief remark because uh, when I sent the abstract, I was not fully aware of the um, session itself. So I, I changed my title and changed the paper entirely. And instead of dedicated, instead of talking about uh, different conceptions of the political, uh, I have decided to look at, in particular, as uh, you can see, in particular about uh, humanity that is used under liberalism. So what conception of humanity do we have under liberalism? So uh, I'll expand on this conception of humanity uh, in, in this time that we seem to be dominated by liberalism and neoliberalism, and they will largely follow uh, Carl Schmitt's position still. Now, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Carl Schmitt, I should probably make some remarks about who he is, which I will do at some point. But And uh, I will draw a little bit on Slavoj Žižek's work, as I was understood Derek wanted to have some Žižek in this. And I hope that we can have a nice discussion after all the uh, panelists have spoken. So let me first start with a few premises, because I think when we are honest about the background that we have, we can have a much more fruitful and interesting uh, debate. I think it will be obvious that I'm not a liberal, but this is not to say that I'm also against liberalism. Uh, I think at best I would qualify myself as somebody who is derogatory called an armchair philosopher. Um, I don't think we should look at an armchair philosopher in an overly derogatory way, though. The reason for this is that in our willingness to act or to change the given order or to ameliorate social antagonisms, uh, we quite often lose sight of uh, the influences on our actions or, or on this given order or indeed on what the social antagonisms are. Most importantly, I think we lose uh, sight that social antagonisms are only a subset of what fundamentally is a political antagonism. So while I would easily admit that perhaps my work is armchair philosophy, I will still defend this position precisely because armchair philosophy is of somewhat higher order today than philosophy that focuses on action directly or change or antagonisms. So. That would be my first pre premise. Sometimes it is better not to act and to restrict our action. My second premise follows from this one. Because one of the reasons we should restrict our action is that we do not fully recognize the repercussions of our actions on the systemic level. Have you, for example, noticed how 
we no longer talk of systems. I, I remember back in the 90s, we would still very frequently refer to systems. Uh, we would refer to system, to uh, antagonism. So the title of my paper, of my talk here, is Humanity and the Liberal, liberal Error. Um, I think we need to talk about humanity in this particular panel more than about what political situation is. Precisely because, as I will show, the liberal error itself can be extremely and extremely dangerous. Uh, but before I start with all of these, I want to make uh, several uh, premises and I want to say whose positions I follow. And mostly I follow here Carl Schmidt's position and Slavoj Žižek's insights. Uh, but I also have three premises. As I said before, the first premise is that sometimes we should restrict our actions, uh, at least political actions, that is. And sometimes we should maybe take a step back and reflect on those. And while I was talking about the second premise, which is the systemic uh, uh, pro uh, effects that we have, um, I was cut off. So I'll start with that one again. What I was saying at the time is that we have learned somehow in the past 20 years or so to hate the systemic thinking, to start thinking on an individual level. And uh, Partly of this is, of course, that liberal agenda is very individualistic. It's the age-old divide-and-conquer strategy. But at the same time, there is a, another problem here, which is that the systemic thinking itself is very political. So my second premise is that there is still remain systemic effects on antagonisms. Third premise that I have follows from this previous two. What is resentment in, in, in a particular case here is that um, the liberal position is very apolitical. As we know from Carl Schmitt's body of work, liberalism fundamentally uh, is fundamentally apolitical because it does not view groups as political agents and instead fragments political action um, that is inherently bound to groups and, in other words, also to systems, into isolated individual notions. Um, our liberal bias is prevalent today still, though, in particular when we compare such things as religious antagonisms with social antagonisms. I'll give you an example. Recall how the various news outlets referred to gender, referred at least, because it kind of uh, quieted down, but how they referred to gender issues as pertaining to individuals, you would always see images of individuals who would invade the privacy. And I think this is quite a key word, that would invade the privacy of the restroom. This is probably the most perverse thing you can think about, the privacy of a public space. It does not follow. And you can contrast these kind of images with the individuals committing acts of terror who are despite being actually individuals, are portrayed in large groups as, as multitude, as an invading horde. And it doesn't matter whether this is, of course, a Christian one or a Muslim one. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm not disagreeing with the latter portrayal as such, or at least not on all occasions. Uh, we had quite some horrible attacks in London a few days ago. I'm not trying to excuse that. What I'm saying here is that the liberal resentment of group thinking, of thinking of groups as political agents, uh, is, in, as, is unable to fully hold to the resentment when, to the same resentment when some antagonisms transcend their apolitical character and become wholly political. So that's my third premise. If you want to speak of political action, we have to speak of group action and not of individuals. So these are the three premises that I think are, are important to keep. But of course, if you do not agree with them, the discussion is going to be very difficult, different. Uh, but of course, also may be more fruitful. So I'll, I'll quickly give you a background of who Schmidt is and why I follow him or his thinking, not him. Um, Schmidt's concern is primarily with liberalism. And this, this concern is... Uh, well, he's telling of his overall project. What, what Schmidt wants to do or to achieve, or wanted actually, 
is the centrality of the political antagonisms and uh, to isolate the domain of politics from other domains such as morality or economics. This is, of course, opposed to the liberal goal, which is to neutralize the political conflicts. So what Schmidt aims to do is, in a sense, to repoliticize what is already a political conflict. But what does that mean? So my claim today is that while claiming a certain demarcation between groups, and um, this is the famous depiction of the political as a friend-enemy distinction, Carl Schmitt nevertheless maintains a notion of humanity that transcends these restrictions on political associations. This worry is precisely that we have to somehow reconcile a universal idea of humanity with the structure of demarcation that emerges in political conflicts. So it's my claim that despite a strong criticism on the shortcomings of liberalism, we have to, uh, at least on some level, accept a liberal conception of humanity, which is one that transcends small groups and, uh, and enlarges itself at the same time. And by doing so, it, it, it minimizes the uh, intensities of conflicts. There is a certain paradox there, but I'll get to that. So the, the concern here is how do we formulate a convincing critique of liberalism and its neutralization of politics? The very premise according to which uh, Carl Schmitt starts his uh, work is that liberalism is a pervasive and even a pervading ideology. The concept of the political, this friend-enemy differentiations depend on a, a, in a contrast way on the notion of liberalism. Uh, Carl Schmitt's student at the time, Leo Strauss, actually made a quite important note here. He said, Schmitt's very basic thesis is completely and entirely dependent on its make against liberalism. In a way, he's saying uh, that without liberalism, there is no expression of political categories. But this also means that without political categories, there is no expression of liberalism. So my main concern here is that the liberal assumption that politics can be somehow neutralized and individualized is not really tenable. For Schmidt, our situation that we have uh, cannot be meaningfully uh, speculated on without a world of antagonism. I think that this is indisputable today insofar that even traditional Marxists uh, and um, communists no longer refer to this dream of communism that is a stateless one or a classless one. The, 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 I'm not saying they've become utopian in the Marxist sense of, of the term, but they nevertheless, the, the final destination is no longer one that, where antagonisms no longer exist. Conflicts do not simply disappear when the political characteristic is removed from them. Antagonisms only move on to another domain. So when we speak in the West today, and what the previous speaker, which I guess was Samantha, uh, was referring to, when we speak of this third way of politics uh, after the fall of the USSR, or when we speak about, yes? Yes. <clears throat> so when we speak about uh, Fukuyama's declaration of end of history or, or, or individual liberalisms, we were, we're already very deeply misguided. I think here we should look very closely at what Slavo Zizek is saying when he calls all of us Fukuyamaists today. I'll give you a quote. Uh, crucial here is the curious enigma of the second way. Where is the second way today? What he says is, did not the notion of the third way emerge at the very moment when, at least in the developed West, all other alternatives, from conservatism to radical social democracy, lost out in the face of the triumphant onslaught of global capitalism? Is not the message of the notion of the third way simply that there is no second way, no actual alternative to capitalism? So that in a kind of mocking pseudo-Hegelian negation of negation, the much pressed third way brings us back to the first and only way. This follows actually what Carl Schmitt was saying in early the 20s, 
uh, that such a world order, such a post-political order could be reduced to the formula of, quote, legitimacy of the status quo. In other words, don't act, but at the same time, don't act, sorry, do act, but act meaninglessly. The political domain, I think, cannot be neutralized, but a pretense to this neutralization of politics would unavoidably lead to conflicts that are more violent. But what, why do I speak of humanity in the beginning? How does it link to this? Uh, I, I will give you an example to make this clear, I think. Uh, the notion of humanity is intended to encompass all of humanity, everybody. But uh, back in 2006, in December, uh, at the European Angst Conference, Zizek made a very interesting point when he uh, was asked, why did Hillary Clinton lose? And he said that he didn't give the same answer as Samantha did before. Samantha said, well, the, the reason for that is because she's typically a corporal. She's, she's part of what we would call in, in the UK New Labour. She's basically a liberal. What, what Zizek uh, uh, says in, instead, and with whom I agree a little bit more, is that a Clinton campaign really tried to encompass everything. It tried to encompass Wall Street, and it also tried to encompass Occupy Wall Street. On the one hand, it was for Christian traditional family values, but at the same time, it was for gender ba transgender bathrooms. So when Zizek was asked why did Hillary Clinton lost, he basically answered, well, look who is excluded. And the answer to this question is quite simple. Bernie Sanders is excluded. So we have here a position that claims to encompass all the positions at the same time, but also somehow uh, is able to exclude the very position that it encompasses. We have, in other words, a paradox. What happens in such positions? I will very briefly come because I'm running out of time. In such positions, what happens is that the other is treated as an inhuman. Their value is limited, is lost, is taken away. Why, how does this happen? It's precisely by looking at the other group as less than human. They are not part of the given order. And this is something that we have to, in a way, reconcile. Uh, how do we look at a certain universal conception of humanity, which is the liberal position, without uh, removing the structures of demarcation that are part of, of human endeavor, which make the other one as a human? So I'll conclude with this, with precisely this, uh, this, how is it, how is it possible that we can unite antagonisms between different uh, groups and respect them as human beings while ant being antagonistic to them? But at the same time, we can pretend that there is no conflict and we're all one human humanity, one part of big humanity. So that was it. I, I hope it was a bit not too uh, unclear, and of course I welcome any questions. If we could go to Samantha Eshman. <laughs> um, Samantha's uh, title is Neoliberal Hegemony Under Threat. Um, just a short bit about Samantha. Um, there's quite a bit, but I'll just take the first <laughs> paragraph. Um, Samantha's research interests span several areas and include post-apartheid economic development, finance, growth and development, and the relationship between finance and real accumulation, the role of the state in economic development, economic and industrial policy, Marxist political economy and value theory, the history and philosophy of e economics, and economics imperialism. It's over to you, Samantha. Uh, firstly, I must say, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here and, and, and to take part in this. But I also need to give you an apology, which is the, it was the British general election yesterday, and I told myself I wouldn't stay up late watching the results. But we don't always do what we tell ourselves. So today, of course, I'm extremely tired. Extremely pleased, but extremely tired. But I'm going to say a bit more about that, because if the question is, is neoliberal hegemony under threat, then um, the British general election is quite interesting in terms of answering that question. But, so I've got five points. 
So I'll let me try and stick to my five points. Firstly, the bad news, which we all know, is neoliberalism is very, very far from being over. Sadly, it is deeply entrenched, deeply entrenched uh, in, 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 on, on many levels in terms, in terms of ways of thinking about the world, in terms of what people think is possible. Uh, neoliberalism is deeply entrenched. In terms of uh, the political discourse, neoliberalism is, 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 is deeply entrenched. I mean, perhaps we should remind ourselves a little bit about, about what it is. Um, it's the strategy the ruling class turned to after the economic crisis of, 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 of the 1970s. You know, we're, very, we're very familiar with what it's meant in terms of policy. It's meant privatisation, it's meant trade liberalisation, it's meant an increase in the role of the market in all areas of social life, particularly in health and education provision. Um, it's meant things like the abandonment of full employment as a policy goal and its replacement by inflation targeting. It's meant shareholder maximisation rather than reinvestment and, and, and growth. So you see co what corporations do is they prefer to downsize and distribute uh, over retain and reinvest. So by downsize and distribute, what I mean is corpor corporations now prefer to lay off workers, to outsource work, and to distribute profits as rapidly to shareholders as they can. So that actually what you see on global financial markets is that corporations who lay people off get rewarded because they're regarded as lean and mean. Uh, uh, and, and, and so on. And in, in contrast with the, uh, to put it simply, the sort of traditional post-war model was much more that corporations would retain some of their, their earnings and reinvest it. You know, that you might actually reinvest some of it in the, in the workforce, in training and skills and so forth. This is now no longer regarded as a, as a good thing. Obviously, it's meant the reduction in union power, uh, the pursuit globally of flexible labour markets, uh, which mean lower wages, which mean outsourcing, and, 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 and so forth. It's meant decreasing taxation for the rich. In sum, it's meant a shift in the balance of forces from labour to capital. That's what neoliberalism globally has, has, has meant. Well, that's what the goal of it was, and that's what the, the outcome has been. And, of course, with it, of course, there's been huge increases in, in inequality all over the world and increasing precarity for, for labour. Um, in, in, let's, we, we can remind ourselves in the, in the developing world, it meant the, stru the structural adjustment programmes. It meant the lending in the 80s and the debt crisis in the 80s, which came with conditions. The conditions were, as we know, the cuts in subsidies, the privatisation and, 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 and so forth. And, and as, as John, I think, quite rightly mentioned, a very important thing has been the way that we see social democratic parties accepting neoliberalism, it becoming part and parcel of the commonplace parlance of, of politics all over the world. So the first point is the bad news, which is that it's still in the driving seat and it's still, still very, very much with us. The second point, point two, is though that I think it is under challenge. It is under challenge, it seems to me, for, but from both left and right. So I think there's a polarisation taking place. Um, uh, why, you might ask, the answer to the question, I think that is quite simple. I think it's because of 10 years of global economic failure and crisis and failure. If we look at the, the, world, the world since the, the global financial crisis, you know, what have we had in, in large parts of the world? We've had 10 years of austerity, of pay freezes, of greater unemployment, um, of cuts in public services for, for the last 10 years. Well, well, the bankers have carried on. I mean, you know, the bankers were the people who literally directly gave us the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, which in South Africa le directly led to the loss of one million jobs. So the very people who caused it have just carried on the same. Financial profits went off a cliff immediately after the global financial crisis. They're now back up to where they were before, rapidly, right down, right back up. Uh, uh, and that's really, really important. And, and, and inequality has, has, has continued, and, uh, uh, as I've said. And so there's been a, there's been a backlash. Um, there's been a backlash and... Um, you know, I think there's a polarisation because the backlash 
it's not just it's not just in, inevitably from the right and from populism. It's also from 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 the left. But I think that uh, you know I think if you look at things like in the states, we see Trump, which I'll come I'll come and talk a little bit about. But we also see the movement against Wall Street, the popularize the popularizing of the notion of the you know we've got the economics of the one percent. You know this is part of the part part of, part, part, part of the situation. So the the the. The, the pol polarization, I think, is very, very important. And that polarization is summar summarized when people talk about the, the politics of hope versus fear. Because the right wing response is the politics of fear. It's the politics of xenophobia. It's the politics of blame immigrants. It's the politics of put up the borders. It's the politics of, of, of uh, attack people who you think are threatening you. The, threatening you. The, the politics of hope is the politics of saying we can unite, we can shift this, we can change this for ordinary people, we can change this for the, for the, minor, for the majority. So, point three then, as an example, is, I think is obviously very important, is Trump. I won't say much about it because it's good that there's, a, there's another session on it later. Um, uh, so, Trump, clearly, obviously terrifying and a, and a very serious a very serious threat. Um, you know, I spent far too long watching the inauguration. You know, when he was in, you know, I was still, I was still reeling from shock. Um, so I spent far too long watching Sky News and it interviewed. You know, there's crowds of people there. So it goes through and interviews them. And okay, the, the issues they're all over the place. They're absolutely all over the place in terms of what people say. But what's the thing that people say again and again and again and again? Jobs, 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 and more jobs. And that's what Trump managed to tap into in a, in a, in, in a horrible, scapegoating, right-wing, nationalist, uh, xenophobic way, but he tapped into that, uh, that, 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 that sense. But I think the thing is, when we talk about Trump, we can't talk about Trump with, with uh, well, and um, forget Bernie Sanders. Because the thing is, the person who also was trying to tap into that mood and that offense of frustration and the, the anger and the bitterness and the feeling that you're completely neglected by mainstream politicians, that mainstream politicians, you know, they don't understand you, they don't know who you are, they don't care about you, you know, they've got no sense of what's going on in your life. The, the, the left can also tap into that, uh, and, and we saw that with, with, with Bernie Sanders, which is an, a completely unprecedented, unprecedented support for an explicitly left socialist candidate in the United States, the country of McCarthyism, the country where the word socialism has been a dirty word for, 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 for two generations. Remarkable, a really remarkable shift, which we'll talk, like I said, we'll talk about more later. Um, and, you know, I am one of those people who's of the view that Bernie Sanders would have a better chance of winning the election, that Bernie Sanders was more likely to, would, would, could, could, have, could have beaten Trump because he had an answer to what Trump said. Hillary Clinton doesn't have that answer. Hillary Clinton is part of the liberal elite. She's part of the liberal establishment. She's part of the problem. You know, she's the weapon of mass destruction. That's my, my, my take on Hillary Clinton. Um, and and the, so the Democrats lost the election. It's more than, more than Trump winning the election, the Democrats, to me, seem to have to, 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 to lost it. Point four, then, I th is, is, is about Europe. Um, and the, the, po the process of polarization, it seems to me, is very, very clear in, in, in Europe. John, John mentioned it last night. Um, two examples. France, very, very important. Uh, Macron won. Um, uh, but we you see at the same time very significant, very worrying vote for Le Pen, who's an out and out fascist. I mean, she's a fascist. She's not just a right wing nasty woman. She's a fascist. Um, a very very significant vote for her. The up complete collapse of the Socialist Party vote. A colla complete collapse of the Socialist Party vote. But then 20% of the vote for Mélenchon, who's a far left candidate, the radical left candidate. 20%, the fifth of the vote. On a, you know, on, a, on an uncompromising, quite radical, dynamic campaign. You, so you see that polarisation in, 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 in France. Again and again, I, I, I'll just I'll talk a little bit about Britain. You mustn't stop. You mustn't let me go on too much about Britain because I'm totally overexcited. Um, but you know, you, you've seen you've seen we've seen Brexit um, and the uh, long story. Uh, but you see an election where the Conservative Party, a very right-wing Conservative Party, at the start of the election campaign, everyone's saying. They're going to walk it. Some people even saying it's going to be the biggest conservative party 
uh, landslide in history, that, you know, it's in the bag, was what they said about the, the, cons the Conservative parties. And yet, over the course of the election campaign, you see Jeremy Corbyn, the left-wing leader of the Labour Party, who's been derided by the media, you know, on every level, on his policies, on his, on his dress sense, on the name of his cat, on the fact that he likes gardening, you, you name it. He's, he's, he's been attacked. He's been attacked from the, the members of his own party, the right wing of the Labour Party, sabotaging, the camp, sabotaging him ever since he came into office. Um, you see a huge surge to Labour. And, and the critical point at the, when the surge begins is when Labour launches its election manifesto. That's the key turning point in the, in the election campaign. Bec and people liked it. People liked it. It said tax the rich. It said end austerity. It said fund public services. It said pay nurses, pay doctors, pay teachers. It said free education, abolish tuition fees. Not something, something that not even Zoom, not Zuma doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't promise. It said industrial policy to rebuild and regenerate industry, challenge the financial sector in the city of London, distribute the wealth more, 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 more evenly nationally. Um, uh, and people liked it, um, and, and I think that's extremely important because it's, it's, a, it's a big attack on, on, obviously on the Tories, but also on Blairism and on the idea that, you know, that the, you have to, the left has to embrace the market. This is a complete challenge to the idea that the left must embrace the market and that if you don't embrace the market, you can't be successful. And uh, you might be interested in The Sun yesterday, which is a very right-wing newspaper, it's a total rag, the Sun yesterday, of course, is owned by Rupert Murdoch, of course had this horrible front page attacking Corbyn, saying, you know, lunatic, so on. It, and, and the list of all the things that's wrong with Corbyn, it had radical Marxist on the front page of The Sun. Jeremy Corbyn, yes, Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott yesterday probably got the biggest majorities that any, any elected MP have ever, has, in Britain have ever got. I, I have to check that but they both got about 75% of the vote in their constituencies. They were you know, resoundingly returned. Uh, Labour won 31 seats, so it's a big increase, but it's, it's, overall it's a hung parliament. But from a situation where Labour being written off to going to a hung parliament with a, with a, with a strong left-wing manifesto is very, really very significant. And it, it reflects something. It doesn't come from nowhere. It reflects the anti-austerity mood and movement. It reflects also the anti-war movement. If you think back to the war on Iraq, it was an imperialist war on Iraq. There was massive opposition to that in Britain. Corbyn was absolutely central to the opposition to the war in Iraq in Britain, and that's where a lot of the, the support base for Corbyn from young people comes from, because they saw him take on Blair, in, 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 and, and they've seen him campaign against, uh, against uh, austerity and so forth. So massive, massive rallies in support. What are those rallies like? They're working class and they're young. And, he said, and, and one of the things he says in his, his rallies is, look at us, we can build communities. Look at us here, we're black, we're white, we're old, we're young, we're gay, we're straight. You know, we can come together and build communities, we don't have to divide. So, so okay, that message is very important. Final, fa point five, point five, I knew I'd get carried away on that. Point five, my final, yeah, my final point. What does all that mean for the left in South Africa, given that this is really what we're here to talk about? Um, I think a few things. One, obviously the ANC are responsible for neoliberal policies in South Africa in the last 20 years. They're the people doing it. They're doing the same as ever, everywhere else in the world, and it's having exactly the same effects as everywhere else in the world, except in the context of a deeply, deeply, already a deeply une, unequal and, 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 and racialized class structure. So we've seen you know, massive corporate restructuring. We see a massive capital, capital strike. They're not investing. That's why there's not, there's not job creation. They're taking money out of the country on a systematic basis. They're outsourcing pay median wages. Median wages, that's the midpoint. So that means 50% of above and 50% of below. Median wages, three and a half thousand rand a month. At poverty level pay, when all the mainstream economists talk about, you know, Labour's, Labour's inflexible and, 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 and so forth. You know, we know the results, increasing inequality, increasing joblessness, housing, health, education crises. All of this, all of this pursued by an ANC government, the biggest, clearest symbol of the, of the ANC's slavish devotion to big corporations is, of course, Marikana. So if you can't get workers to go back to work, shoot them. 
you know, shoot them, defend people in the interests of, of, of defend, defend white capital, utterly nakedly. And now, of course, it's hideously corrupt. You know, we see absolutely massive, massively corrupt. At the same time, it's corrupt. And I think that the weaknesses of, of, of South African capitalism fuel that corruption, you know, because, 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 because there, there aren't the op opportunities. Massively corrupt, where the ANC MPs are, mass are, are, are pathetic, pathetic. How many times have they let the, has the NEC let them off the hook? You know, um, I mean, how many hundred thousands of emails do they need? Um, you know, they won't even dare vote against Zuma in Parliament unless they have a secret ballot. I mean, I'm, you know, you know so um, the thing is, what I think the left can make gains, okay? I mean, the left can get, make, make gains. I think that the, the, the Corbyn example, the Sanders example, you can make, if you fight with working class politics and a clear message, not simply in elections, but obviously in terms of struggle and organizing resistance from below and, and so forth, um, um, you have to, but I think that we need to face the fact that in South Africa the left is terribly weak and I think divided and fragmented. Um, you know, I think that uh, an, an agenda for the left has got to talk about trying to build unity across these, these, these sorts of di di divisions because, you know, we've got the SACP, we've got Kasatu, but we've also, you know, we've got NUMSA, we've got SAFTU, we've got to talk about and to and with NUMSA and SAFTU, we've got the EFF. Uh, and so on. So I think we've got to talk about some sort of a, a left alliance. But I lend I lend on what the question for you is. For me, the the the, 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 the I, I don't understand why people remain inside the alliance, the alliance between the SACP, the ANC, and Kasatu. To me, it doesn't make any sense. To me, it's just a prison. It's allying yourself with the very people that are pursuing neoliberalism and pursu pursuing, uh, you know, predatory capitalism. It's allying yourself. It's allying yourself with the problem. And how can you put up a principled, consistent fight against the people who are the problem if you're in alliance with them? So that's my conclusion. Sorry to go on. The title of the, of the piece I'm going to present is A Call to Conceptualize Capitalism Today. So I want to start by acknowledging um, that I think it's very important and even overdue that the analysis of of the economy and indeed of capitalism more broadly has been firmly put on the South African agenda over the last few months. I would add that it is significant that these questions raised through the discussions of radical economic transformation and white monopoly, monopoly capital have been put on the agenda by those outside the South African Communist Party. It is significant because while Communist parties across the globe have talked about capitalism. Much of, the, much of broader left thought has, since the later 1960s, centrally addressed other questions related to justice and freedom, from questions of state domination to, to gender and sexuality. While politically important in their own rights, as famous feminist critic Nancy Fraser has argued, many of these studies bracketed the issue of what capitalism is, how it was changing, and how it articulates with the, with, the, with the alterations in the state of the, and of the feminist movement and other, and other social movements. Notably, Fraser showed in a brilliant piece published in New Left Review that many of the feminist gains in the 1960s in the West, including equal pay, flexible work times, and the critique of state bureaucracy, transformed in the 1990s and 2000s to a form of capitalism that paid so little that two owner households became the norm, Flexible work times became a norm for maximizing profitability, and the critique of the bureaucratic state has turned into a rolling back of all kinds of social services. In other words, in the absence of a critique of capital, capital managed in the 1990s and 2000s to appropriate otherwise progressive struggles and to profit from them. Of course, the South African story is a little different. Questions of capitalism were on the agenda for the broad anti-apartheid movement, beyond the party alone, until at least the, the late 1980s. While there are lots of arguments about the complicity of capitalism and apartheid, race and class during the 1970s and early 80s, during the 1980s, many corporations deserted apartheid because, as, I, as I've argued elsewhere, the kind of apartheid cheap labor model was no longer the most effective in increasingly technologically advanced workplaces. While many of these changes were underway, what is interesting is that many on the left, broadly speaking, 
moved away in the 1990s from analyses of capitalism as such and towards transition questions about, about the economic uh, me mechanics and mechanizations to increase productivity and to broaden access to the economy. And so in thinking about the future of the left, this move away from the question of capitalism is exposed today as a problematic one. And there's a move, I think, among, among many on the left towards reopening it. Discussions that name white monopoly, monopoly capital and radical economic transformation are positive because they enable us to focus attention again, not only on the specific sectoral and economic issues, but on the character of capitalism itself. And here I think it, it is the case that South Africa provides a very useful place from which to think not only about its own predicaments, but about those of the left more generally, globally, in, in the global south and in the north. In this talk, then, I want to I want to ask some of the old questions that I think have become urgent again in the current conjuncture and their implications and ask about the implications or consider the implications for future political strategy. So as John Pampalis said in his opening yesterday, for much of the left's history, it has been concerned with issues of inequality. I would add to that that, it, that at least since Marx, the left has been very good at pointing out structural inequalities and injustices. That is, it has managed to show how that what, which may appear to be a matter only of individual inequalities between people are not just the results of individual choices, but are instead produced by social position, education, access to resources, inheritance, and so forth. And the attention to these structural questions has, has led the left to practice, whether under the banner of Marxist-Leninism or social democracy, the left attempted to mitigate or even eliminate the equalities, inequalities between people by trying to close the wealth gap, whether by dispossessing the rich or taxing the wealthy, ensuring minimum wages, funding public education and healthcare for all, and providing an extensive system of social welfare. In Western Europe, the social democracy version of leftist politics was so successful that much of the welfare state became the status quo by the 1960s. In these countries, leftist movements would embrace would move away then from capitalism and embrace, to embrace an anti-colonial movement, a uh, feminist movement, and a strong critique of bureaucracy, and even of institutions, such as prisons and mental hospitals. For this new left, the focus thus shifted from economic inequalities and towards other social inequalities, as well as towards what it perceived to be the authoritarianism of bureaucracy. Critical social theory, traditionally a space of unorthodox leftist thinkers, followed this pattern with figures such as Sartre, Marcuse, and Foucault, becoming extremely popular. However, the, the developments in the 1970s and 80s would call into question that societies in the West were moving towards the lessening of social inequalities and economic ones. On the one hand, the election of Reagan and Thatcher heralded the dismantling of the welfare states with the cutting of, uh, with the cutting of, of benefits and the privatization of public programs, including the divestment of mental health public systems and the privatization of prisons. On the other hand, advances in transportation and communication technologies began to make it viable to move production across borders under cutting labor regulations. This meant that agreements designed to ensure sufficient income for social reproduction were undermined, unemployment and, and underemployment increased. Crucially, in the realm of production, there was also a material shift away from labor-intensive industrial and manufacturing professions. Either this, either this production disappeared from Europe and North America entirely, or the nature of work changed drastically with the introduction of advanced mechanization, both of which left many unemployed, some of whom were absorbed into the service sector. So in addition to unemployment, what occurred was the rendering precarious of many occupations, to the extent that standing has co coined the term precariat to signal a shift from the, the proletariat. As John alluded to yesterday, one issue here is that former, formerly secure white-collar workers, along with casualized traditionally blue-collar workers, and a rising group of service sector workers have little security of employment or even of occupation. The broader implication, of course, is that notions of class, that of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, of ruling and working class, should be revisited. They've changed. There's been a change structurally. Right? The rethinking of class is important. After all, the categories of bourgeois and proletariat have been imported wholesale and in rather reified terms from Marx's 1848 Communist Manifesto rather than from his more serious analysis of capital, and had to be stretched even in 1917 by Lenin to use them. 
So you'd, you'd think that things had changed enough now that leftists would be, re, would be willing to rethink the terms of class 100 years after Lenin or the Russian Revolution. What follows from here also is there, is there a need to rethink capital itself. As I mentioned, some leftists in Western Europe from the 1960s became com quite comfortable that everybody knew what capitalism was and that, it, and that inequalities were decreasing. And, the thing, and I think the same is true, the same idea that capitalism is self-evident for many in the Eastern Bloc and those espousing Marxist-Leninism. But I'm not sure that we know very clearly what capitalism is today. Certainly capitalism cannot be summarized sufficiently in the contemporary world as a relation where workers' labor is exploited by the ruling class who receive an unjust profit from un unfair production processes. Of course, that's still a feature of capitalism, right? And there is still exploitation of, of wage workers by capital. But is this the only or even the dominant relation of, of society? Are a team of highly skilled, highly qualified mine workers in Australian mines, where machines do most of the digging for gold, in the same relation with Anglo-American as our 1946 mine workers in Johannesburg? In addition to shifting workplace relations and a large number of unemployed, when we relook at capitalism today, we see the rise of financialization. What is financialization? I'm sure Samantha can get quite technical on this, um, but, but briefly, it's a process of making money off money without the production of commodities. If you remember Marx's classic formula, M meaning money, commodity, M prime, making money off the production of commodities and ultimately through the exploitation of labor, what financialization is, is M to M prime, right? Financialization does not rely on labor in the same way. It is money circulating within all sorts of financial markets and stocks with the promise of making money off the future price of commodities and of money itself. Although financialization is not new, why it is so important to understand today, right, is that it's become, in its current incarnation, it's become central to accumulation and has become integral to the privatization of all sorts of goods that were previously managed by the state. Pensions here are a classic case. Healthcare too, even education. You see Kuro private schools listed on the stock exchange. It's share price going up consistently. That, that's what matters for quality education, right? So let's return to South Africa and consider the implications of what I see as these shifts in capitalism. If we start with class, should our politics really be aimed at overcoming unemployment? A close reading of Marx, supplemented by evidence from workplaces, suggests that capitalism is structurally not geared towards mass employment, and that the future of capitalism is going to see fewer and fewer people in full-time secure work. Sure, people all need to find ways of earning money, and so many people in our society and others work or trade informally. But maybe our leftist politics should, be, should not be aiming at the direction of trying to get everybody to work. What would, the, what, what would it look like to turn to grants as a viable alternative to wage labor? I'm aware that social grants have long been viewed by leftists as reformist rather than revolutionary. But maybe now is the time to pay attention to grants as potentially revolutionary. Surely also this would be faithful to the marks of Grundrisse and Capital which does not try and redeem wage work, but regards wage work as intrinsically alienating of who we are as people. What would a leftist politics look like at this historical juncture that tried to extend the grant system as far as possible and to abandon the assumption that full employment was achievable? Please note that here I'm not talking about just celebrating South Africa's actually existing grant system, but rather changing it along the lines of ba universal basic income. In addition to this, though, we need to take seriously the issue of public institutions. At the moment in the country, when we look at health or education, what we see is that private corporations and entrepreneurs are viewed by the government positively as relieving the burden on stretched public institutions and infrastructure. So private medical aids, private hospitals are seen as, as taking the burden off public hospitals, as, as, as allowing the state to cope, right? But in addition to the large income gap, it is these institutions, education and health, that produce and structure inequality in our society, right? I would add that the South African state seems quite willing to accept the privatization of institutions. Take universities, for example. These are public institutions, some of which receive substantial additional money from donors, including the one that employs me. Um, but why are salaries across institutions not standardized according to position? 
Why are universities able to charge such varying fees to students and to basically behave like corporations? I think that the Fees Must Fall movement highlighted, among many other things, the lack of public accountability of institutions of higher education. I'm not saying that academic content of universities should be decided by the state, not by any means, but rather the governance and management of these institutions should be much more financially equitable and equal and transparent across the country. Even if we accept some inequality between universities, the cost of entering universities and the salaries of staff should be open, should be clear, and should be equitable. So I think that a leftist politics in South Africa in the future could organize itself around grants and around what I'm calling somewhat awkwardly the public, public, publicization of institutions rather than the creeping privatization that seems endorsed everywhere. I don't agree that the model of the state should be the entrepreneur um, at all. And I've not even spoken about public creches, orphanages and parks that seem neglected by the state and its willingness not to take public leisure seriously enough. I do think that these can be the basis of radical economic transformation. Of course, I've not yet addressed the question of land, right? Which is a major question for many advocating economic freedom, right? But I want to draw attention not just to agricultural land, right? Which is the typical, which is the typical topic when land is spoken about. While it is true that the state has built a, a good deal of housing after apartheid, Housing itself remains important. Whether we are talking here of, in terms of ownership or rental, it seems to me that one major area where we see the legacies of apartheid and colonialism before I so powerfully at work is in housing. This is because it is here that we, that we see that for, for some white South Africans, wealth comes from more than their income, but from what they inherit, from their accumulated family's possessions. And for many black South Africans, it's just a matter of income. And of course, you find that white people, some white people own multiple properties, and property itself becomes its own wealth generator. That the government leaves housing largely to the market rather than intervening on it seems to me con to continue to drive inequality and consolidates older inequalities and extends them. This is one major area that might be addressed by radical economic transformation. Finally, in the current conjuncture, I do think that there's some tension between the idea of the publicization of the economy and its, its nationalization. That is, there's a tension between the creation of public goods run by strong principled bureaucracy and the channeling of resources to a government to use as they will. Perhaps the current difficulties in the ANC start to reveal this tension between a government who nationalizes against the state who makes public. But we need to think more about that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Program Director. My name is uh, Sigfrid Tivane. As uh, already said, why is it not okay? My name is Sigfrid Tivane, as already said. Uh, this presentation was supposed to be done by uh, Professor Maharaj, uh, but uh, he received a very urgent uh, invitation by the Communist Party of China and he had to accept it, so he sincerely apologized. It's not a matter of priority. There were some issues that he had to attend to. Uh, he could have been here. So let us uh, forgive him. Uh, this will be uh, just a brief demonstration of the message he would have liked to send or you as a conference to receive from him. Uh, I'm not the professor himself, so don't expect uh, that uh, professorship. So, <laughs> okay, let's get uh, right to it. Uh, we have to first, of course, uh, acknowledge uh, Umzala himself. Uh, I mean, uh, for the undying spirit that he had maintained throughout. I mean, without such uh, uh, character, we wouldn't be here today. So such people have maintained their left for us as we have inherited it, particularly us as young people, I must say. So we acknowledge him by the words which were quoted. I'm quoting the words regarding him, which says, his bidding, his bidding, oh, sorry, his biting, sorry, his biting at times 
provocative criticism did not always please everyone, but nobody could doubt his fierce commitment to the oppressed and exploited masses of our country. So this is the kind of character I'm talking about. A man who's decisive, a man with courage, and a man who did not compromise. So I believe this is a very sweeting introduction to our presentation here. Yeah. Uh, we move right along to the introduction rather itself. This is to try and demonstrate rather, oh, I never really introduced my message, sorry, sorry. Uh, it is about uh, the impact of the capitalist mode of production on the environment. You know, emission, pollution, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is rather the gist of the message, but I believe you have seen the title already. So this is uh, what it is. So here we're trying to demonstrate the capacity of men and some of the uh, accomplishment that uh, the mankind have accomplished throughout. And that if uh, this uh, kind of capacity could be harnessed towards helping uh, society and its development, it could be put in good use. But rather this uh, is to demonstrate that man has capacity to do uh, beyond what uh, we expect or beyond what we have seen already, even in these accomplishments. This is uh, also to demonstrate uh, the effect of uh, emission on, on the environment. Uh, there's a quote that says, if we continue, uh, if continued increases in atmosphere, carbon dye will change worldwide weather and plant growth. This is uh, the impact of emission on life on Earth as we know it, and that uh, it threatens the future of the life of human beings and of uh, animals. So this is to say, not to get uh, deep into it, is to say we really need to look at it as a threat, as a hazardous threat on life on Earth, and something should be done uh, to, to prevent this from continuing. This is a quote, these are quotes from people who have come before us, we have, noted, we have noted the problem way in ages before us. And now we have arrived at it, and we are aware that uh, it is becoming increasingly problematic. Emission is a problem. Uh, overproduction, which is actually what underpins emission, is actually a problem. So we need to look into it. We need to discuss, among other things in this conference, what is the impact of the capitalist mode of production and what should be done. This is a very urgent issue to all of us as we're going to be discussing in this conference. So we're not only looking at unemployment, we're not looking at financialization, only we're looking at also the life itself, you know, uh, the human life itself on Earth. Castro, you know, one of the most uh, celebrated uh, revolutionary also had something to say on the impact of emission on life on Earth. So these are some of the quotes. I can't go through them, they are long, but you can see. So it's to say the left have already went deep in analyzing this problem. Ours is to take it further and come with a solution. You know, uh, Marx says the philosophers have analyzed the world, but ours is to change it. So Castro have also taken the task of saying, here we have a problem. But what is this conference going to say? Are we going to say we have a problem as well, or are we going to come with solutions for the problem? So it's our responsibility as a conference. This is uh, how the impact of uh, economic growth, rather, or economic activities on emission on Earth generally. Uh, so you can see the line, say there's a line down there that demonstrate that as the economy grows up there, emission also, also, also is impacted on. It's still the same, it speaks to that, that actually human beings have uh, already crossed the boundaries when it comes to emission, when it comes to, to, to pollution and other uh, uh, problems. So this is our uh, combined and even world. It speaks to the economies of the world. 
as per the gross domestic production, you see the US here it takes the bigger chunk of the pie, China taking the second larger, and Japan and so forth. But also, it's not only about the GDP. If you look, the US is the first in terms of emission. It is on 23.32%. Uh, China follows. But China, I'm, I'm aware that they have policies set in place to actually reduce emission um, in the next 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. But there are actually uh, uh, policies in place. And by far already, they are actually on the quickest uh, downfall in terms of reducing it. So, uh, but this is how it is. You can see even us in South Africa were there, although we're a small pie, but we're contributing to that. So this is a problem. A greener future will not be decent by, by default, but by design. So say we need to take a decisive action. We need to make this happen. We should not wait for it to happen by itself. It will never happen by itself. We need to begin to have uh, you know, discussions around this and solutions to this problem. So this is uh, Africa. This is African economies. And I think what Prof is trying to demonstrate here is to say, as Africa also need to catch up with the rest of the world, we're also going to contribute to emission. We're also going to contribute to the destruction of life on Earth and, and, and so on. So we need to, to be honest about this problem. Because most of the time, we, we, when we discuss problems of Africa, we say it's problems of poor growth, it's problems of unemployment, and so on. But what mode are we going to implement in terms of solving those problems? Are we still going to adopt the capitalist mode of production? Are we going to catch up in terms of GDP and so on and so forth? And if we are to do that, we have to industrialize. And if we are to industrialize, obviously the impact of, of industrialization on emission will, will therefore take effect. Uh, Africa endogenous development uh, for ECOD. Yeah, I'll read. It says, though the United States will no longer be leading the fight against climate change, Africa has already been st stepping up to the plate. At the moment, Africa currently encounters, accounts for the smallest share of global greenhouse gas emission, a percentage 3.8% compared to China at 23, the US at 19, uh, percent and Europe at uh, 13 percent. This is also to emphasize on the fact that as Africa catches up, it will ultimately also contribute a very significant portion of, of, of percentage in terms of uh, emission. So we need to find a solution. Our solution cannot necessarily be to uh, copy and implement what's happening in the U.S., North America, I mean North America, Europe, and, and China. So we need to, to be decisive in this conference on that aspect. For me, this is a very critical part because it talks to life itself. We can discuss many other things, but uh, if uh, the most urgent issue is not addressed, it's as good as future. In conclusion, Prof says, uh, and I, I read, he says, by August 2, 2017, we would have used more, than, more from nature than our planet can renew in the whole year. This is to say, whatever destruction we're causing, it cannot actually be reversed. It, it, it's continuing. The impact on, 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 on what we call on global warming and so on and so forth. So these are critical issues uh, that needs to, to be given a priority. Oh, sorry. Uh, he says also, and I'll jump others. Oh no, let me read them. We use more ecological resources and services than nature can regenerate through over over finishing, over harvesting, over fishing. Sorry, over harvesting forest and em emitting more carbon di carbon dye into the atmosphere than forest can uh, sequester. So we need to to really uh, be conscious about uh, that. There is a quote here, it's hidden by uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, Skype. So can I look? Yeah. It's a very important quote, though short. It says, you can see, I couldn't see because of the scab. It says, socialism for the 21st century is, in short, not capitalism. That is to say, we need not in this conference to sit here and discuss how we can reform capitalism, but rather how we can usher in socialism. It's quite critical for this conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks. Uh, uh, and that, that's uh, the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, what I will do is to request that we have a first round of questions and then they respond. Uh, if you can introduce yourselves as well when you, when you get the mic. Samantha, you have expressed outrage at the African National Congress and the Alliance. I'm not going to defend that because I want to make use of this opportunity to learn. Sometimes when you are inside the hot pot, you, 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 don't, you don't see the reaction outside that increases the heat. So I want to make use of what you just said to learn because I'm inside the alliance and I do acknowledge its weaknesses. But one thing that touched me in what you said is the way you, you have profiled the British Labour Party, and of course, correctly so, Jeremy Corbyn's courageous left campaign. And my question is, crafted to compare what's happening in Britain to what is happening in South Africa. And it is as follows. May you please remind me which political party did Tony Blair come from and what policies were pushed in Britain, in Britain under his prime ministerialship? Thank you. But I'm um, Unfortunately, I'll also focus on you, Samantha. Uh, but before, I want to comment on the, I think you, you posed a question to the House as to why people are still in the alliance. Um, I think maybe it's, it might also be the view that uh, some people, they still believe that they can change things around inside the alliance. Because for other people, as they view it, going outside the alliance will mean that they will still need to, they will still have to reorganize again. And while they will still, still trying to reorganize, the liberals and what we are already starting to see will gain more power. And how will that happen? I'm just wondering. So I think one of the reasons are that they have a view that they can still change things around. But the question maybe we might be asking is to, do they have that political capacity to, to move things around? Because there might be an interest, but if there is no political willing among those elected or those who are key players in it, but still a question you know, to, to everyone. And then my, my question is on the second, and my question is on the point that we have seen some um, I want us to, to come straight to the South African context in the issue of is neoliberal hegemony under threat. And I want us to look at, in, here in South Africa, we've seen some major events, so one may say historical events, as to what we saw happening in 2012 in Marikana, where uh, the, the, the workers were, were moved down. Um, we've seen NUMSA, you know, breaking out from, from, from Kosatu, just recently, we've seen a new federation, you know, um, being formed with Zolin Zimavavin and the others. But my question there, maybe, is, do you think all these historic events that have been taking place recently, do you think there's some effect that they can do in trying to change the status quo 
and also in trying to challenge the neoliberal hegemony because it is true uh, that COSATU and the ANC have been so patient with these policies which are neoliberal. But do you think there will be any effect that can be done by these new changes that you are saying with regards to SAF to being a new federation out which is pulling this direction? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, my question is for Babrak. Um, given what he said about third way politics and given that he quotes sludge of Zizak quite a bit, who I also enjoy reading, I want to know what are his views on the politics of Barack Obama? What, does he view Barack Obama as another third way politician in the mode of new Labour and new Democrat? Or was he a genuine progressive who was just obstructed by the Republicans? And then a quick question for Dr. Ashman. Um, how, um, what could South Africa have done better to avoid neoliberalism, given that it is a small open economy? Um, so what can SA have done better um, to act as a bulwark against neoliberalism? Um, obviously things changed around 96 with Kia. Well, have, would have been, R the carrying on of RDP, all the kind of stuff, would have helped? Yeah. My name is Ben Moyo of the Zimbabwe Communist Party. Well, we are really newly launched. My question is directed to, I think it will touch on all the three comrades I've just presented, particularly touching on uh, our environment and the left. Our experience with the Chinese, for instance, in our country is that the Chinese companies, in collaboration with our comrade bourgeoisie, have been involved in massive pollution of our water bodies, destruction of the environment, refusal to observe labor, labor rules. And to a large extent, we, we see them as part of the, of the problem. Perhaps my views are tainted by our own history, the role that the Chinese played during our struggle in support, in support of what we perceived as, as counter-revolutionary movements. And the ongoing exploitation of what we see is, is the destruction of our environment and the pollution, the use of mercury, for instance, in our rivers and the destruction of our water bodies in a very massive extent with impunity. Thank you. I was thinking whether I should ask this question or not, given that I think it has been asked in one form or another to Barbara, and at a risk of being accused as an interest. Uh, don't you think that given the fact that the ANC has always been and continues to be a multi-class uh, organization, and that uh, depending on which class are leads at a particular given point in time, and then the dominant ideas of that particular class will shift the ANC to a particular direction. Uh, don't you think that is, is it not necessary for, for the party to continue to be in the alliance and seek uh, to, 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 to lead the, the ANC within so that it can shift the ANC to a particular view that is of that of uh, that that one that is propagated by the party. Uh, I, I, that, that, that is just my rather than abandoning the, the ANC as a vehicle of change. My name is Garnet Kaff. My my question and comment is directed to Samantha, Comrade Samantha. Um, on Brexit, you didn't say anything. I'll be interested in a left perspective of Brexit. There's this uh, neoliberal perspective that is promoted by the media that Brexit was essentially a rightist move. Um, that staying within the European Union uh, should have been the right thing for Britain to do. And I also find the left trapped in that perspective. The European Union is there for a neoliberal management of, of capitalism in Europe. And, and, and whereas it's imploding, 
you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's chaotic. I mean, you, 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 you have a, a, a political, uh, okay, uh, but, but I'm saying it's, it's imploding in that uh, it is dominated by Germany. Um, so in many respects, uh, Germany is able to impose its will over those many countries of, of Europe and, and, and the sovereignty of different countries um, of Europe is, uh, is not fully expressed through uh, the, 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 the European Union. And I see many on the left, they say we should save uh, European Union, we should not allow it to, to implode. I hold a different view. Uh, I, I would be inter instead, I think the left should instead push for a different solidarity of Europe, European countries, you know, outside neoliberalism that the European Union promotes. I, I would be interested in your views. Uh, I think uh, we need to be quite honest about this. I mean, capitalism has no moral boundaries. It does not seek to develop a society in favor of people, but it seeks to make profit out of anything. So it's exploitation of resources of Zimbabwe to actually beneficiate the transnational corporations from China. So we need to be quite honest about it. So this is the problem there in, 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 in your question. It's not necessarily on pollution per se, as I've emphasized also on my presentation, is the capitalist mode of production that we need to do away with. I believe uh, that is the center of problems of environmental hazardous issues everywhere else in the world. So it's not necessarily the problem of Zimbabwe alone. So I think I've captured, I've covered what you have asked. Thanks. Okay, I'll try, try not to take too much time. Um, I'll ask the, the, in response to the last question first on Brexit, because I didn't say anything about that, and it is very, very important. And um, you're, you're quite right that the, the left was divided, and a lot of the left did take a position which said we should remain or we should remain and reform. Um, I, I didn't take that view. I mean, there was also a, a, a minority of the left which argued for a sort of for a left re Brexit, for a left leave, um, that the European Union can't be reformed. That if you look at the European Union, uh, it's 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 really it's a club for bankers. And you know, under Thatcher, I didn't like monetarism very much when it was elected. But the EU was given as unelected monetarism. So I'm I'm not a I'm I'm for remit, I was for leave. Um, th now the, the left critique of the e European Union was actually very was was tiny in the in the in the referendum, which is one of the problems of the referendum. The problems with the referendum was that that it was dominated by the right on both sides. <laughs> um, uh, so you know that that you know made it made it made it hard, but you know particularly Greece. You know Greece was very important. I think people could see very clearly what the EU had done to to Greece and to Syriza and how the EU had re has really imposed on Greece. It's destroyed the social fabric of Greece in a in a in a in a in a, in a hideous way. And I think that 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 did come over come over, and there was an argument to have solidarity with Greece, but. But also, people, people, I think people often misinterpret the result of the, the election in the sense that they say, "Oh, it was it was just a sort of racist, xenophobic uh, vote." Now, I'm not, I wouldn't deny that that was present. That was present. But at the same time, a lot of it was about the, the things I was talking about: the bitterness, the feeling of neglect, the feeling that you don't listen to us, that the entire political establishment really was telling us that we have to accept this, that the EU is the only way forward for British capital. And part of the feeling in the in the election was, well, stuff you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stuff you. You're not listening to us. We don't have any jobs. You don't care about us. Why should we do what we tell tell you? And and you look in lots and lots of really really solid Labour areas. You know, there was that sense of, you know, even Labour is telling us we've got to vote for this. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. Um, Trying to go on, Alex, Alex in, from inside the hot pot. Uh, um, you know, I mean. <laughs> You know, comparing Britain to South Africa, it's, 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 it's different in the sense that Labour is very, very far from perfect, but the Tories and Labour, to, to some extent, are still class expressions. You know, the, what one of the people says, if you're a, you know, the, the only two sorts of people vote Tories. Millionaires and the misguided, you know. And if you want to, you, you know, 
And if you want to work out which one you are, you just need to look in your pocket. Um, you know, there is still a very, there, there is, still a, I mean, it's, it's complicated, but there is a class expression in, in Tories versus, versus Labour, which obviously you don't get, it's different from the ANC because of the National Liberation Movement and, and, and so forth. But I mean, one thing, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is not a revolutionary Marxist. You know, he's got a, a left reformist agenda. But the thing is, he's got a, it's quite a muscular sort of left reformist agenda, but it's one which he's consistent and he's about and he's prepared to fight about. And what's interesting is the way that he's mobilised people and he's inspired people, but from within and out, in and outside the Labour Party. And Corbyn doesn't make it a condition that you have to join the Labour Party in order to be part of the fight. And there are lots of people involved in, in, the, in the Corbyn movement who are not actually paid up members of, of the Labour Party. And that's the strength of it. It's, a, it's the recognition by the Corbyn campaign that they need, you need parliamentary and extra parliamentary action. You need extra parliamentary struggle. But if you just leave it to the electoral terrain alone, you won't strengthen our side. Okay. T two more then. Um, very quickly, what could South Africa have done better? That's a very good question. And, and a, a lot of the, sorry? Tony Blair, what, I mean, I, I, I could swear a lot. Uh, you know, so Tony Blair represents, so within the Labour Party, there's a, there's, a, there's a historic difference between the left and the right. You know, Tony Blair represents um, the, the, dif the, the bringing of the free market into the Labour Party. You know, he's the man who led the modernisation of the Labour Party. He's the man who abolished Clause 4 of the Constitution. Clause 4 of the Constitution was the, is the, was the socialist clause of the, of the Labour Party's Constitution. It said to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their labour and the equitable distribution of it based on the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. You can see what sort of a teenager I was. Okay. Um, you know, Blair, Blair got rid of it. You know, he's the guy who led the modernisation and so forth. He's the guy who, who, who did the war in Iraq. He's, he's f f f f affectionately and frequently referred to in Britain as Bomber Blair. Um, but this is, this is, again, so the Corbyn, the Corbyn success in the election represents a massive blow to Blairism. And that's why we're all so happy. You know, the, the, um, yeah. Is that enough on Blair? I could go on, I could go on about Blair. <laughs> like, great length. What South Africa, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, what South, what could South Africa have done better? Obviously, a lot goes back to the nature of the settlement and the concessions that were given to capital both before, during, and after the, 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 the settlement. Um, and, then, and then, obviously, gear made things, made things worse. Um, you know, Clearly, controlling finance would, would, have, would have helped. Clearly, channeling money into labour-generating sectors would have helped instead of trade liberalisation, which destroyed jobs in labour-generating sectors. Clearly, that would have helped. Greater investment in education instead of AIDS denialism would have, in education and health instead of AIDS denialism would have helped. I, I, I didn't expect a socialist paradise from the ANC, but I didn't expect really mass murder. Uh, through AIDS denialism. Uh, uh. But I think one thing we can say, for Mandela, obviously there are many positive things we can say about Mandela, but Mandela does need to take his share of the blame, I'm afraid. Um, because I think if there was one global states person who could have stood up to the World Bank, who could have stood up to the IMF, who could have stood up to all the global powers which say you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, there was one person in the world who could have stood up to them and said, no, look at our history, look what we've been through, look what we've been left with, we're not going to go down that course. We're going to take a different course. I think if there was one person who could have got away with it and not been penalised, it was Mandela. Uh, and so, I'm, uh, you know, obviously, I, obviously there are many positive things about him as well. Um, but the final, final, final question. Um, okay, the, you know, if, if we were outside the alliance, wouldn't this strengthen the right? Um, and, and, and so on, and you know maybe we can stay in the alliance, and we can we can shift things around, and, and so on. And you know, I, I mean, again, I thank you for it, for inviting me, and it's it's nice to be able to share my share my share my views with you, and, and thank you for listening. Um, I suppose the question I would ask myself is: is it, is it working? I mean, you know, are you are you you know is the left pushing the ANC? Is the left pulling the ANC to the, or is it the ANC is pulling the left? That would seem to me to be the, the million dollar question. Uh, 
you know, I, I mean, you look at the crisis of Zuma and you look at the corruption and I listen to the radio and the, the level, and Zuma's a national joke. You know, he's held, I mean, he's just a joke. People either are disgusted or they think he's funny. You know, nobody, nobody is taking them seriously. I mean, you know, I mean, um, uh, and yet, you know, I, you know, I don't see why, I really don't see why the SACP ministers didn't just walk out. You know, why didn't you just walk out? Say, look, you know, this guy's over. This guy, this guy is taking us down the toilet. You know, why, why should we carry on sitting? Why should we carry on sitting in the, in the, in the cabinet with him? You know, I, to me, that represents the, the ANC's pulling, pulling the party to the, to the, to, 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 to the other way. And, you know, think about something like Kosatu. Kosatu, okay, it's great Kosatu said it's, it doesn't want Zuma. That's great, it's, it's, it's functions and, and so forth. Um, and the May Day events were, were, were extraordinary. But what's the alternative? So we, we're not going to have Zuma, but instead we're going to have Ramaphosa? No, I mean, what, I mean, I'm serious, because Kasatu's endorsed Ramaphosa. So we're going to have a principled left opposition from Ramaphosa. I mean, <laughs> But that's, what Kusato, that's who Kusato's endorsing, I'm, I'm, I'm not wrong. There's not going to be a principled left position for Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa supported the Marikana massacre. Ramaphosa supported everything. So, so okay, all right. Um, um, <laughs> so the, the thing to me, I mean, okay, if you want my opinion, it seems to me, we, you know, we need, a, we need a, the left needs an alternative to the ANC. And the left needs to talk about together about how to build an alternative to the ANC. A mass left alternative to the ANC that brings everybody together. It brings the SACP together, it brings with Numza, with Safdu, with people from Kasatu. Because that could be a real force in society. So I, I want to provoke uh, Samantha, but uh, um, she views uh, neoliberalism as a policy choice, right? As a question of policy. Right, and I'm, what I'm curious about is where we put in kind of structural dynamics. One of the things um, that we saw in, in Western Europe and North America, regardless of whether the left or right was in power from the 1940s to the 60s, was the growth of the welfare state, right? So whether conservative governments or, or left-wing governments, of course there were differences in tone, um, you know, there was nationalism and xenophobia and whatever, but the state increased, right, dramatically, and welfare increased we saw that, that starting to decline from the 1970s. If you take a country today um, that, that has been through up to 2017, uh, a sustained period of left-wing government, Brazil, what you, st what you start to see is, in the last year or two, unemployment increasing. That the, the employment that was created alongside Bolsa Familia, alongside the expanded welfare state, became, was rendered precarious. Unemployment has, has increased. This points to a problem that, or points to the fact that neoliberalism may be more than a policy choice. It may be a historical phase in the development of capital. It may require something more than just saying we're against neoliberalism, but, but working, working, trying to contend with what the structural forms are, reckoning what the forms of employment that are being created are, and so on, and, 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 re, and repositioning the role of the state. Um, you know, that... There's a dualism, a, a Cold War dualism that I he hear kind of being, um, being sort of re-inaugurated between the left and the right. It's always the goodies versus the baddies. And I think um, there's some validity to that with the, rising, the rise of, of extreme right-wing forces. Um, but at the same time, I think in South Africa, you know, you have a genuine right, but I think that within, within the left forces, there's a lot of fragmentation, a lot of uncertainty about how to position ourselves. Right? And, you know, I think non-sectarian forums like this are precisely very positive because they allow that, allow us for a moment to, to say, to, 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 to step back from that and say, okay, it's not the EFF or the ANC or uh, the Communist Party who've sold out. Let's, let's have a discussion. What are, the, what are the forms of possibility that, 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 and that the current moments allow? Um, so that's my challenge to you. You don't have to answer it, but to the, to the audience. What is neoliberalism? Barbara, I'm um, sorry to leave you last. Can you respond to your question? Um, are you still there? 
Yes, yes, I am. Sure. Okay, so the question uh, was, what is Slavoj Žižek's view of Obama? Am I correct? Did I hear that right? Yes. Okay, so obviously I cannot speak for Slavoj Žižek himself. Uh, but I, I, I know that according to his uh, writings in, uh, and, of course, some of the lectures, his position is not so as critical as one would expect him to be. What, what he has quite often mentioned is that with Obama you have a certain, you had by now, a certain change of discourse in the United States. What we witnessed with the, the so-called Obamacare or the Affordable Act uh, is precisely the change in the discourse in the United States. The discourse being before one of choice, you know, people need a choice, and Obama actually challenging that discourse, not by taking away the choice of the citizens or of people of the United States, but rather by providing another one. And through this maneuver, at the same time, creating, a, let's say, at least a fairer system, if not a completely great one. Uh, on, an, on, a, on some other issues, though, it's quite clear that uh, he's quite critical of Obama. So uh, when I said before during my talk about uh, what happened to the third way, or rather precisely what happened to the second way with the coming of the third way, this, of course, does not change in his criticism, in, in Shizek's criticism. Uh, Obama does, of course, embrace the new liberal policies. If there was anybody... Uh, to just keep up with some of the themes today. If there was anybody in history who could have overturned Guantanamo Bay, for example, or who could have acknowledged the atrocity, I mean, at, even the way it was done was horrendous to speak of. But if there was anybody to do this, it was Obama. It's not going to happen under Trump, of course. Uh, and the way, Ob uh, the way Obama dealt with the whole issue was laughable. I mean, he did not come to terms with the with the actual horrors that happened there, but somewhat smirkily remarked, hey, we tortured some folks. Well, you don't torture some folks. It's not something to to discuss in joking manners, although even it was not joking, just meant to uh, remedy somewhat the very grave situations happening. So there, is, there are some plausible things to look at that change the discourse for the better, let's say for the more left-winning policies, but at the same time, there is definitely not enough being done. I think that would be Zizek's view. And of course, again, I cannot speak for him. That's just the way I would interpret him. Uh, I hope that answers your question. My name is uh, Patrick Hosea from uh, UKZN. I'm a doctoral student at UKZN. As much as possible, I'll just try to be short. Quickly, I want to start with... Uh, the last speaker on ecocide or socialism. Uh, I I want to pick my points from uh, the argument you your your the, the first comment you made that re regarding the fact that uh, we must see this from uh, a communist perspective, a socialist perspective, the urgency of the matter. And uh, your your presentation, like you said, is not is is from the prof. It's more explorative and you just try to describe the situation. And then uh, quoting Fidel Castro in 1972, where he said the problem uh, is almost too late to prevent. And he said the cause, I'm just summarizing that now, he said the cause was uh, the consumer society. And then you gave the graph and the, the, the likes. So my question for you, sir, is that uh, how do you, in your opinion, how do socialism come to play in the concept of uh, mitigation and adaptation, especially on, uh, around the, 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 the environs of resilience uh, thinking? How do socialism comes to play there on that ground? Uh, okay, that's that for, for, for you. And then for the doc. If you can, if you can try it, quickly. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the last point is on uh, the, the comments by Doug that are around SSPC and the alliance and the like. So I, I, I will not dodge on that. But I just want to ask, the, the, the concept of removal from the alliance cannot be spontaneous. So in your own opinion, how, what should be the 
what would be your recommendation as to the realistic tactics uh, for a reconfigured alliance for the SACP? What would, in your own opinion, be the realistic tactics for a reconfigured alliance? Thank you. Bennett spoke about the, the location of the concept of monopoly capital outside of the South African Communist Party. But when you look at, the, and you trace this back, the origin of the theory of monopoly capital, from Lenin interpretation of Marx, Das Kapital, and his assessment of capitalism, that capitalism essentially has reached its highest stage of imperialism. If the location of the concept of monopoly capital, capitalism, or white monopoly capitalism, as it is currently in South Africa, is located outside of the SACP and expropriated by other forces. Is it a good or a bad thing? And why is the SACP not owning to the characterization of capital in this country as essentially white dominated? That would be the first question. The second question would be about in relation to the Fees Must Fall movement. That as much as the forces of decolonization are on the rise, similarly and with equal force, forces of imperialism are on the offensive through people like Helen Zeal and, and them, would it ascribe that, subscri ascribe that to the weaknesses of the liberation movement and its failure to equip the social forces that coalesce around decolonization and empower it with the necessary revolutionary tools to decolonize effectively and to lead in a sustained manner the offensive against uh, imperialism. And in this case, the, the tools for, for, for decolonization cannot be found anywhere else outside the teachings of, of Franz Fanon. What is your take of that? Yeah, I, I think uh, after the facts, uh, we need to accept that the two-stage theory was a fatal mistake. And, uh, and we need to acknowledge that Azapo, after all, was correct. Uh, to say that the two-stage theory will never usher in socialism. And today we are clever after the facts that they were correct. And uh, obviously, all along, we are of the view that our leadership, having spent years in the struggle, having spent years in exile, are not going to betray the revolution. And what we did, we lowered the guard. And today, uh, the rest is history. Now, there is an illusion that a rectification process will happen in the ANC or the Alliance. And that is an illusion. It is a myth. It will never happen. Now, those who know Peter Mugabe, Peter Mugabe wrote a paper uh, and I hope that uh, somebody will find that paper for me. He wrote a paper where he said the ANC must be honest and admit that it is building capitalism. And I'm sure the, 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 the spokesperson of the ACCP will actually maybe save in that particular uh, paper. Uh, and having read that particular paper, I'm sure when he goes back, he'll actually advocate that if the SACP is serious about finding his soul, must leave the alliance. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, let me just. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, let me say that, uh, you know, um, and I concur with. The, the, the speaker, the Bernard, 
uh, I think Bernard is on point, and I think we need to follow his way of thinking, and then I think we'll go somewhere. Thank you. The problem of emission is a problem of, uh, of capitalism in a sense that capitalism, uh, rather the, eco the capitalist economy is measured, there are indicators that measures it. One of it is GDP, which is growth. And for it to sustain itself in a competitive global capitalist system, it has to forever grow. For it to forever grow, it needs to overproduce, hence the emission. Now, it would mean, therefore, that for us to mitigate that, we would need to take that uh, particular <laughs> production uh, uh, mode and transform it. And that would be to transform it to serve the society other than saving profit maximization and so on. I mean, capital, the, some, most of the problems raised here, financialization, job casualization and so on, they are just uh, symptoms of the broader problem of, the, uh, the, of capitalism. So to be quite honest, we need to begin to discuss how to usher in socialism. And how, because I mean, we cannot continue to grow. That is quite unnatural. You know, if you grow, you end up, <laughs> you know, being destructive. So it's a problem of overgrowing and, and ultimately overproducing. That will therefore lead to emission, to pollution, and so on. So as we discuss industrialization, we need to, of course, be mindful of that. Why, why should we industrialize? Should we industrialize for profits or should we industrialize to create jobs? And, and to sustain life, or rather to actually ensure that uh, there is development or societal development. So I think that is uh, my answer to the uh, uh, question that was posed in terms of what is a socialist uh, uh, intervention to the current uh, challenges of emission. I think I'm, I'm, yeah, I think I'm done. No? Yeah. Don't want Okay, unfortunately, I didn't get that comrade's name. Um, I'm sorry, but thank you for the questions. Um, I think it's an interesting development that the critique of white monopoly capital has come from outside the South African Communist Party. Um, and I think it's, I mean, the way I presented it or approached it in the paper was to say that that's a positive thing, that, um, that people outside the alliance... Uh, that voices outside the alliance making these, these kind of arguments, it may lead to greater discussion, it may put other things on the agenda and produce new forms of analysis. Um, I have, I, I mean, I think that the, the in, that early analyses of white monopoly capitalism um, that have come through the SACP have been very interesting, but I think one of the things that needs to be thought urgently is, and people are starting to do this, is that white monopoly capitalism is not quite the same as it used to be. The structure of the economy has changed somewhat. Um, you know, when, we, when you see Google opening offices in Cape Town, Amazon opening, opening offices and so on, that's not white monopoly capitalism in the same way that uh, we can speak about Anglo-American in the 1950s, the 1960s, you know, based on a cheap labor model. Something else is happening in the economy, which is not to say that there's not something there's not a monopoly on the economy that is not, it's not racialized in deep, in, in deep ways, but, but certainly white monopoly capitalism has internationalized um, in the last decades, and that needs, that, needs, that needs to be thought and rethought. And so I think those older analyses are very useful, uh, but they need to be posed against new evidence and new developments. Um, and I think the fact that, as I, to reiterate, coming outside the, from outside the alliance, I think is very useful, and it stimulates people inside the alliance and the party as well. So... Um, so I think that these are, to be, these are things to be welcome. Um, I, I like Fanon very much. Uh, my caution, I think, would be a, a similar one um, around questions of uh, imperialism and decolonization and higher education. Um, I think uh, Fanon gave amazing insight to the, world of the 19, to the world of the 1960s in Algeria, to the world of the 1950s in France, to the colonized subject. Um, and I think that those, that those are categories that can be armed and reused in the contemporary, and they have been by Fismas Ford. But I, again, I'm not sure that the forces of imperialism are exactly the same. Um, we have a drive in higher education um, to, to a very market-oriented model. That's not necessarily the same as a, as a state-led colonial form of domination that Fanon was grappling with. Um, so again, I think that these new situations require some shifting 
right? As Fanon himself said, the colonial situation means Marx has to re be rethought. I think that the financial situation means that Fanon and Marx and all others need to be rethought. We, it's important to read these people and rely on them, but, uh, but our situation requires thoughts ourselves, right? We need to think ourselves um, in our situation. So, we, so yes, but thank you. I think that's very, very useful. I'll try and be quick, but can I just repeat that point, which is that having these kinds of non-sectarian debates are really important, and you know it shows we can do it. We can get, get in a room and we can disagree, and we can talk about uh, you know the way forward. And, and I, you know, I'm spending most of my time talking about the structure of the South African economy and financialization and all these sorts of things. So for me, it's really good to be able to not talk about that and to talk about these more explicitly political questions. But it, it, the comrade asked, uh, "What are realistic tactics for a reconfigured alliance?" Okay, so I'm going to be very, very rude and say, I think you're asking the wrong question, my comrade. Um, and the, the question itself is, a, is an, a reflection of what I think is, I'm trying to argue, is the problem. Because the, what, you're, what you're trying to do is trying to be, how, do we, how are we realistic inside the alliance? How, so therefore, therefore how, do we how do we accept the constraints? And then how do we find a little bit of wiggle room within the constraints? And I think, I'm, I think what I'm trying to say is, guys, you know, you want to be the vanguard of the working class. Stop thinking like that. Be bold, you know, be brave, be principled, be out there, be on the streets, be saying we're the opposition, you know. We're, you know don't say, how can we possibly get a better... A better uh, arrangement inside the inside the uh, alliance and the EFF. Okay, we can discuss the EFF's politics and its program and so forth. But guys, look at what they've done. You know, look at what they've done, and look at what they've done in Parliament. Look at them raising marikana in Parliament. Look at them pay back the money in Parliament. Could have been you, okay? But your alliance partners, your alliance partners would have. Whipped your hides faster than okay. You know, you know the point. Um, it could have been, you know. So we need to think. Isn't that what the left should be doing? Shouldn't the left be filling that space? And we can't say we can't make lots of criticisms of the EFF, and there are criticisms to be made of the EFF. But how can we make criticisms of the EFF when we are not doing it ourselves? So we have to do it, and, and we have to be less um, uh, timid. I think, and in the, com the, the comrade who asked, what, what recent developments, Numza and Saftu, was that, the, that was the question. Look, my honest answer is, I hope so. You know, I'm, I, I don't know. Um, Saftu's only just been formed, but it's been formed on a good basis. You know, what it's arguing for, what its kind of principles, what it's going to try to do to me are good. And everyone in the, this room should support them and, and work with them and be with them and see them as your comrades, you know, not as... Splitters, Numza are your comrades. Amku are your comrades. You know, they fought in the platinum belt, you know, for six months. They won a, a massive historic, you know, well, they won a, 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 a pay rise against white monopoly capital. You know, these people, we, we should only think of each other as brothers, comrades, sisters, friends, people to debate with. And, and it's tough. I know it's tough because there are historic divisions, there are historic differences, two-stage theory, all that. But we have to be big enough to be prepared to say, actually, what we need to do in this country is too important to put those things first. Okay, thank you. Um, Fabric, do you have anything to say to round off? Are you still there? Well, I, I, I first want to thank you, actually. Uh, for even though it was very uh, not able, I was not able to come to South Africa. I nevertheless was somehow able to participate. So thank you for organizing this, Derek, for me. And I hope my my, my talk was not too confusing without seeing what's happening and through this medium that's still probably not working as effectively and being broken up in two. And uh, lastly, I of course want to very clearly state one thing. Workers of the world unite, as we, as we used to say. I think this this saying, or rather this quote, should not go unnoticed today because we somehow very easily forget what the end aim is. 
and we may be too much stuck in the contemporary issues without the focus on the future ultimate aims. Thank you. Um, let me just, before I hand over to you, Derek, for housekeeping, can, can I, let me say perhaps as a, a point of rounding off. Earlier, I think in the earlier session, one of the points that was raised was around the national question. And we did say, as the Mzala said, that's one of the things that we, we want to focus on. It seems to me that, uh, and I'm looking at the Eddie and the, the launch this afternoon, the unresolved national question. It seems to me that the questions that are being asked about the relevance of the alliance and what ought to be done as a way forward, given the stage you are in, still raises that issue of what it is that Mzala and others were trying to actually put to the fore about where your racial apartheid struggle uh, was actually, I mean, supposed to end, the racial struggle was supposed to end and where the class struggle was supposed to be. The one uncomfortability I have, and I always, and I hope this conference is actually going to help us, is the idea of a two-stage theory. And I'm asking this not as an answer, but as a question. Is it originating from within the ranks of the alliance or was it a formulation outside the alliance to try and understand this very, this very kind of relationship between the ANC and its alliance partners that we say is actually quite central to some of the problems we're having? On, based on three subtopics, one is going to try and look at the crisis of global capitalism and how it impacts on us in terms of pursuing development uh, and, and politically. The, the second one is going to be the, the weak challenge of the left to capitalism. And then I'll, I'll conclude by analyzing the two and, and provide some suggestions in terms of way forward. Uh, with regards to the first issue, of the crisis of global capitalism. Uh, I think the global capitalism is imploding. That's how deep this crisis is. It's a crisis that is not going away. It's a crisis that didn't just start with a financial meltdown uh, that resulted into a great recession uh, in 2009 but rather it goes back in the 70s uh, when the post-war boom uh, came to an end and a slump in the global capitalism uh, uh, crept in. So the response of, of capitalists to the 1970s slump, because what had got exhausted was the uh, the, the demand that has been created by the destruction of war, the investments that ha had been made uh, in the war effort, the investment that had been made uh, to take advantage of the demand that had arisen uh, in, in, in advancing certain industries, uh, such as the uh, automobile, uh, housing, uh, um, and, and so on. The, in the 70s, from 1945, th that, that boom came to an end. When it came to an end, they had no runaway industry in the northern uh, uh, countries of the globe. So instead, they financialized, they globalized. The financial sector tended to play a more of a prominent role. Um, that's when neoliberalism was actually inaugurated. Uh, so in a way, we've been sitting with a stagnation in the economy in that uh, since the 70s, the, the, the crisis that had kicked in uh, of low growth, of low levels of profits, uh, was never resolved, but instead was managed through financialization. Uh, and it had devastating effects to, to the South, you know. Uh, the debt problem in the South, 
the, the modernization of poverty in the global south and, and, and uh, the, 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 the deepening of inequality that has been building from the 70s, actually, you know, even in the north and, and in the south. Uh, so, so, so what we saw in 2008, 2009 was an implosion or an explosion of this long building uh, crisis of, of financial capitalism, of financial capital dominance, rather. Uh, and still, uh, the, the response of capital, they are found wanting. They don't have a runaway industry, you know, whereas uh, after crisis, uh, they usually, like, uh, after the, the, the Great Depression of the 30s, the automobile came about and it was a runaway industry. So they could invest there um, and, and, and build the economy uh, from those investments. Currently, there are no outlets for, 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 in, for productive investment. There, there are no outlets. And even the talk about the fourth revolution is not going to solve their problems because for as long as you, you have low levels of consumer spending, of aggregate demand in the economy, there's no automation that is going to solve their problem. So this industrial revolution actually is unlike earlier revolutions uh, that were able to employ people in large numbers and thereby creating a, a higher aggregate demand. This doesn't do that. And so it is still not a lucrative uh, outlet for productive investment. So, so, so it's a crisis, therefore, comrades, that is raging and it's not going away. Um, Samir Amin says, or first, Emmanuel Wallerstein says, this crisis is going to be with us for the next 20 to 40 years. Uh, even after that, capitalism is not going to come alive out of this crisis. He says even capitalists are aware of that. So all they are trying to do is to build a successor to capitalism that will still be another social system of class hierarchy of exploitation. Uh, so that, that, that's what they are trying to do. Samin Amir poses, di poses it differently. He says, uh, should we save a capitalism that is in crisis, or should we save humanity from a capitalism that is prone to crisis? And, and, and he, he does a lot of analysis to show that this crisis is, is not going away. Uh, in fact, even mainstream economists, Paul Krugman, uh, Stieglitz, you know, the bright minds of the economics professions, they, they are conceding uh, a concept of stagnation, which means a, a, a period of long-term low growth levels uh, has been brought back to economics. I, even, even them, they are talking about it. Even IMF in their outlooks, they talk about this crisis staying with us for much longer. Uh, even the South African Treasury, uh, in its outlook, say the same thing. So I'm surprised why they call this recession that happened a technical recession, when they know anyway, it's a crisis that never went away. So we're bound one way or the other. Look, look at the data. Growth levels have, have always been low. They, they never went back to what they were pre-2008. You know? So even National Treasury says it in their outlook that this crisis could be with us for much longer. They said that long before these results of last week were published. So, 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 so it's, it's, it's a deep crisis. Samir Amin concludes by saying, actually, he retorts by invoking Rosa Luxemburg uh, uh, remarks that we are back to either barbarism or capitalism. Yo, sorry, socialism. It's barbarism, which is this crisis of capitalism, or socialism. That, that's, those are the stark choices for humanity now. 
If not socialism, another system that will be egalitarian, that will promote social progress is needed. Barbarism is never an option. But, but if there's no alternative, uh, Samir Amin is saying we're likely to, to be trapped into this tragic impasse uh, for, 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 for much longer. Uh, so, so it is against that background, really, that uh, the South African economy is doing badly uh, uh, because it is highly connected to the global economy uh, in a dependent way of exporting uh, raw minerals. We, don't, we never built a sovereign economy after 1994. We, we continued the old accumulation of, that is dominated by these monopolies in, in mining, uh, finance, and, 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 and energy. Uh, finance grew larger, actually. I mean, it, it became what? Uh, it's now 20% or 21% on other days of our GDP. And yet, we're not exporting any financial services. Actually, these banks you see here, they're not owned here. They are foreign-owned. And, and that's what makes the concept of white monopoly capital inadequate to explain our situation, because it assumes that white people here are owning these things. This is foreign capital in all industries. You know, um, uh, 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 the monopolies are owned from, from outside. Now, and, and the neoliberal policies that were inaugurated officially in 1996 enabled South African capitalism to restructure that way, to globalize and financialize. So it's not like uh, they, are, they are unpatriotic, you know, as some say. No, no. no. The, the, the policies we adopted, had, had we adopted more audacious policies that control the movement of capital that pushes an industrial, active industrial policy, results would have been different. Then that takes me to, to the next question of the weak challenge to capitalism uh, by the left. <clears throat> uh, the, the dramatic downfall of Soviet Union 27 years ago was the biggest event uh, that shifted world political affairs. <clears throat> uh, not in favor of the left, you know, uh, in favor of the imperialist forces led by America and their uh, allies in Europe, Japan, and elsewhere. <clears throat> uh, and and, and you, 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 we saw that, that, I mean, immediately, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, U.S. sought to render the United Nations ineffective. They unilaterally invaded Iraq during the first Gulf War in 19 February. Oh, I can't remember the month now. But uh, in 1991, they invaded, or late 1990, they invaded Iraq unilaterally. Uh, <clears throat> so, so, so the, the collapse of the Soviet Union you know, was, was a blow uh, to the international left. But I think sometimes it's exaggerated because it's posed as though the, the Cold War was simply between the US and the uh, Soviet Union. You know, the, the, the world affairs were simply dominated by the US and the Soviet Union in that simplistic way, that this side, it was the US with its allies, this side, it was the Soviet Union with its allies. It's, it was not like that. Remember, comrades, there was always China, which was never allied with the Soviet Union, you know, in, in being subordinate to it. And in the 60s, there was the, the, the senior Soviet split. I mean, Soviet Union advocating for a peaceful coexistence with the West or capitalism. China is saying, hell no. You know? so, so, so China always did things its own ways, different from Soviet Union. And China even had a seat in the Security Council of the uh, United Nations 
And they would not call Kremlin to ask for mandates when they go there. No, they, they would vote on their own. So China has always been its own man. But other than China, there was another factor as well. There was banding comrades. You know, the 1955 conference uh, where they met, oh, I'm about to conclude. Cool. The, the, there was banding as well, which really organized uh, countries of the South, Asia and Africa. I mean, Egypt was leading Africa there. Um, uh, and later it became the, uh, <clears throat> the non-aligned movement with C Cuba playing a, a more leading role. But now that I, I have to conclude, let me rush to come back home quickly. Here, the bigot, uh, so, so, so the, the fall of the Soviet Union also coincided with the weakening of the left. And I conceptualized the left as not just communists, but you had communists, you had social democrats, you had national liberation movements. You know, those were the main camps. They, 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 they have since gotten weakened and they have never revived. And it seems the model that they follow, the political model that they follow, the old left, the communist party's national liberation is exhausted. Uh, and then that takes me to the SACP. To say the SACP has been the biggest player in the South African left. Currently, the SACP has grown to be courageous to speak against the rot of the ANC. What should we make of the critical posture of the SACP? Is it audacity or still quagmire? I think they're trapped in a quag quagmire. The, NC, the SACP doesn't want to, to, to make a decision that we're leaving. And, and, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a united front, and, and yes. On the other hand, they are pushing for Cyril. No, Cyril is our man, but no. We have not, we have not officially announced, but everybody in the SSCP is saying Cyril. So they want to play safe. So whichever way the outcomes, they said, no, no, we never push for Cyril anyway. So if they leave, <laughs> we said, no, 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 no. We always indicated that we might leave. So yeah. So. It's, a quack, my, it's not clear what do they want to do, but it's worse now. Actually, the SACP, in the, of all the alliance bodies, it is the only one uh, uh, that, that can break out and, and forge something truly of a project, because it is a political party. It's not a faction. It's not a substructure of the ANC, but it does not want to operate that way. And I'm saying the reason the SACP is not able to be audacious is because for most of the time in the 90s, the SACP never had an independent program of its own, so, that is socialist, that it used in the alliance to bargain, to say, as the SACP, this is how we want things to be, um, and fight over it. Um, there were times when the SACP fought, but uh, uh, when the balance of, of forces in the ANC changes, they say, no, 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 they join. And then, no, 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 is corrupt. When they said, no, no, we need a law to defend Umsholos. You remember, Comrade Blake said that. We need a law. Because there's a lot of attack on Umsholos, you know? And, 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 and so, so it's a quagmire. I don't know how they are going to handle it. Uh, and, and again, we, we have the EFF. The EFF, I think, is part of the new left. Uh, <clears throat> the new kid on the block, they should be praised for having brought back radical demands of land and economic transformation. You know, however, their notions uh, at times seem to be limited, but, but at least you know, for that. And, and corruption as well, for, for being very vocal on corruption. But the EFF is limited strategically. They don't seem to be having a clear vision you know, around which they mobilize. They, they, they like more anti than for something. They, they don't have to. They, they, don't seem, they don't seem to be having a clear strategy that follows their own promises that they are mass protest movement. They, they, don't, they are not involved in community struggles. The only time there's a big match is when there's Juju. EFF is largely organized around the charisma of Comrade Julius Malema. And I think that's good, but it's also a weakness because the EFF can't grow beyond his charisma. Uh, and, and the old left, the other old left, the Trotskites, the PACs, the Azapos, 
they've just become irrelevant. I mean, Azapo had a conference. Azapo had a conference, it was only covered in Facebook. No media, no, no media house covered it. So, so in conclusions, Chair. One minute. It, yes, one minute. In, in this minute, as I conclude, Chair, <clears throat> I'm saying the challenge for the left is that <clears throat> we need to push for a, a, an industrial, a sovereign industrial production system in the country with strong manufacturing sectors that will employ more people. Uh, sovereign in that it must de-link somehow from a, a global capitalism. Not completely, it will always be relative. But again, sovereign because it must have a, an agricultural sector that produces food security and, and, and food sovereignty. And our idea of a movement towards socialism, we must abandon these old ways of thinking, you know, even about class struggle, that is the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in a constant struggle. We, 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 we must think rather about how we mobilize popular classes through a program that expresses their own demands. And, and at the same time, uh, it, it relies on their energies. We should just forget about this vanguardist, entrist approach. And it's good the Communist Party is talking about a united front. And, and, and therefore, in that united front, both the, 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 the type of democracy we promote should, should, should have the, the, the elements of uh, both the representative and, and the participatory, strengthening more the participatory forms of democracy. And lastly, this movement towards socialism uh, should be a movement uh, of unity in diversity. You know, uh, we should try very much. Remember the first international, Karl Marx didn't go there having in his pocket the Communist Manifesto. He went there to engage with other comrades and he was elected to be the main drafter most of the time. And as, as he was drafting speeches of the First International, he didn't slot in unilaterally the Communist Manifesto. No, no, he still engaged comrades based on their own programs from all European tendencies there. And, 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 and the First International was strong. But the Third International, I think, that's why they said, no, no, one country, one Communist Party. Maybe we should abandon that Communist Thank you. Over to Alex. Comrade Garnett, I have my notes here. And I was discussing with a comrade of mine where I was seated as to what approach must I adopt. He advised me not to read the notes, but to talk. But I'm changing that decision. I'm going to read the notes. <laughs> Because if I talk, you might think that I'm responding to what you just said. The notes were planned before I listened to you. And just uh, my, my note for Comrade Samantha, I did discuss this with her before we started here. Comrade Samantha, in the last session, you were able to disaggregate the British Labour Party. You were able to bring to the fore certain tendencies in the British Labour Party, the conservative, the reactionary, and different strands. And you said this. The weakness of what you did is that when you came to the ANC, you just simply said, this is a bunch of neoliberals. So you didn't disaggregate it. But I don't blame you. We must do it for you because we are here in South Africa. We must say to you, there are revolutionaries in the African National Congress who are more progressive than the people or the characters you mentioned in the British Labour Party. Because under Tony Blair, British did two things. It deepened neoliberalism and it made war. And you can't be praising the British Labour Party and are taking the African National Congress and its alliance. That is a contradiction, which is why I raised the question I did raise. We will, <coughs> we will disaggregate it on another platform. The main challenge facing economic and social development, I think this is our subject now. It is. OK. Challenges facing social and economic development in South Africa. That can be summarized only in one word. In one word only. 
capitalism, Comrade Garnett. That's the primary contradiction of the South African society. And I wish to even say this to some of the students who are here who have been leading the struggle in campuses, forging a movement around the notion of decolonization. So far as I understand it historically and otherwise, in South Africa, capitalism is a colonial mode of production that unless you do away with it, you will not even decolonize. The decolonization struggle in South Africa must be a struggle to overthrow capitalism and remove it because it was imposed as a colonial mode of production from Britain. And of course, the Dutch East India Company. That is, what it, that is what it should mean by decolonization. I just thought I should add this. Now, the primary contradiction facing the South African society, as I said, is capitalism, as well as its continuing legacy of colonialism and apartheid, and its dominance in the form of imperialism. The imperialist agenda of neoliberalism, as Comrade Garnett has said, developed over the past few decades predating our April 1994 democratic breakthrough. It was streamlined and hardwired in our post-1994 policy from 1996 by the adoption in government undemocratically under the leadership of Thabo Mbeki as the executive deputy president of the state of a policy called growth, employment, and redistribution in short gear. There was no consultation. It was very bad. I saw a letter in the media, Tabumbege, asking us, why are we comparing his presidency and that of Jacob Zuma? There was just no consultation under Mbeki when this policy was imposed in government. In fact, I still remember him, Garnet, when he was still within our fold. If I were to quote him at our 10th National Congress in Johannesburg, he arrived there and said the idea that some of us are going to build their movements on the savage carcasses of the African National Congress is wrong in the extreme because the death of the ANC will not come. In other words, telling us to leave the alliance, something that Mandela said a day before. So there was just no consultation. And in fact, the alliance was marginalized. There was this fight. I wish we could create another session where I debate this. The development of neoliberalism, as Garnett said, is traced by many studies, at least to the, to the multiple crises of capitalism that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, displacing, displacing or eroding the post-World War II relatively regulated capitalism. In his Capital Volume 3, Karl Marx writes that capitalist production seeks to continually overcome its imminent barriers, but it does so only by means which again place such barriers in its way and on a more formidable scale. In this context, neoliberalism can be characterized both as a product of the multiple capitalist system crisis from which it was developed as an inner system alternative, in other words, an alternative within the logic of capitalism and as the cause of the multiple crises of capitalism that were to follow, including the ongoing crisis that pose a challenge to social and economic development in South Africa. The recent announcement of, the, of this investment and exit from manufacturing in South Africa by the US-based multinational corporation General Motors. I'm studying the sector in my PhD studies and my professor is here. I was just finalizing one of the chapters we will be discussing in a week or two. This is the reason why I borrow from that sector, because I spent a lot of my time writing and researching about that sector. So this uh, exit by General Motors is part and parcel of the results of the crisis of capitalism. And I'm looking at it from a point of view of its impact in the value chain as well. The same applies to the recession that South Africa experienced after the 2008 eruption of capitalist crisis and the one announced this week. Rather than merely a set of right-wing ideas and policy regimes, neoliberalism has developed from those ideas and policy regime to become a dominant form or the reigning variant of capitalism and imperialism, which according to Lenin is the highest stage of capitalism. Neoliberalism is no longer just a set of ideas or policy regime. It has actually restructured the labor process 
and given rise to a particular variant of capitalism. Let's call it neoliberal capitalism. It has also manifested itself as an imperialist agenda, giving it an, a neoliberal outlook on a global scale called neoliberal globalization. We must unite to address and finally resolve the problems of class inequality, unemployment, and poverty, all together with their racial, gender, spatial, internal, and external dimensions. But unless we appreciate that class inequality, unemployment, and poverty form the conditions of existence, the products and lever of the accumulation of wealth on a capitalist basis, we are likely not to go to the root. That is, we are likely not to become radical in seeking solutions. We are going to be seeking solutions in the hot pot, within the logic of capitalism. And immediately we do that, we are going to repeat what Marx said about capitalists, who are able to overcome impediments to their system of accumulation, but only by means that place or lay the basis for the emergence of new impediments on a sustainable basis. Yes, let us address these problems, as Marx and Engels say in the Manifesto of the Communist Party, when they refer to the immediate aims of the working class and enforcement of their momentary interests. But at the same time, let's take care of the future, which is the overthrow of the system. Because capitalism doesn't come from, the problems of inequality, unemployment, and poverty do not come from white people, as the narrow nationalists want, to, want us to believe. They come from the system of capitalism which in South Africa, of course, many capitalists are, happen to be white. Uh, so this appreciation must distinguish what, in my view, should constitute a distinguishing factor between the left and the right. right. One of the challenges the left will have to address, having coalesced around a common program, uh, distinguishing it from the right, is to develop and unite behind a common program, articulating to borrow from Marx, as I said, the struggle to achieve the immediate interests of the working class. And the working class is, pro is broader than wage labor, right? The, the struggle to achieve the immediate interests of the working class enforce their momentary interests and push forward for socialism. A political economy social formation in which the exploitation of one person or class by another or the domination of one country by another uh, will be abolished or eliminated. We are still oppressed from Britain, where, of course, there are left comrades there. I don't know why they can't overthrow the system from home. Okay, so by and large, the Freedom Charter, particularly its clauses or economic transformation and land distribution thematically features frequently and prominently as the basis of such a common program in many calls made by a number of left formations. It must be taken seriously while we open space for innovation, creativity, and dynamism. It is not my intention to address, and I, I have inserted this point in this current notes because I was going to address a different topic. I didn't complain about that because, I mean, I enjoy some of this. It is not my intention to address related to the points that I've just made about the importance of unity of purpose, the question of organization, strategy, and tactics of the left, except to highlight it at this moment. I hope the question will be addressed in detail during the session on responses to neoliberalism, right-wing populism, and the role of the left, which will be chaired by mentor there, Comrade uh, Ding. However, I would like to highlight two works by Lenin, left-wing childishness and pity bourgeoisie mentality, and left left-wing communism and infantile disorder. Referring to the left in Germany in 1920, Lenin said, it is obvious that the left in Germany, the left in inverted commas in Germany, have mistaken their desire, their political ideological attitude for objective reality. That is a most dangerous mistake for revolutionaries to make. This tendency, he further said, easily calls to revolutionary extremes, but it is incapable of perseverance, organization, discipline, and steadfastness. Linked with this, it will be dangerous to propagate politics suggesting that everything is possible at a stroke. And associated with this tendency is people simply saying, you know, these things are possible. The problem is that there is lack of political will. Of course, that could be a problem, but we must pay attention to objective conditions. It is important to appreciate the 
that the necessity to forge the broadest possible left unity arises from and is a response to the objective conditions of the struggle. You are talking about the struggle. You are not talking about the implementation of a change in a vacuum, in a laboratory, just where there is no resistance. There are forces that are in charge. And as Antonio Gramsci say in the state and civil society, that capitalism is in crisis. Does it mean that uh, the capitalist class that controls the system has lost its strategic advantages? And you can just come in and take over at the stroke of a lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important to appreciate the, ne that the necessity to forge the broadest link, the broadest possible political front, as I've said, comes from and is a response to the objective conditions of the struggle rather than a subjective exercise. Related to all of this, it is important to analyze the structural constraints of legislative and government power. A comrade earlier on here quoted Fidel Castro. What happened in, in Cuba? They went power nationally. But the enemy was very powerful externally and held up the revolution. In South Africa, we achieved a democratic transition in 1994. The enemy retained control of the economy of South Africa. And the enemy was not just some internal white people in this country. It was the imperialist system. And in fact, as uh, Garnett has just said, imperialism in South Africa deepened further post-1994. And its economic stake is more stronger than it was in 1969, when the ANC analyzed it in the Morogoro strategy and tactics, pointing to West Germany, Japan, the United States, Britain, and France owning a stake in this economy that if we were to inter that if we were to tackle the apartheid regime militarily, the enemy was going to pass over from passive support to active military intervention. You see, this thing of analyzing these issues without an analysis of the balance of forces and what they mean on the ideas that we generate could lead to left to, to what Lenin here referred to as left wing. Uh, uh, childishness. I have five minutes. Thank you very much. I have about three paragraphs. I will be done. Thank you. Uh, we will need to pay attention. To, like in South Africa, if you are to make a law, if you are to pass, you have got to consult. There is a judiciary, there is a legal system. And when I talked about capitalism, I'm not just talking about such an abstract system. I'm talking about even the legal doctrine governing this country. I'm talking about the constraints that gave rise to that legal doctrine. And when I'm talking about the structural constraints of power, I'm talking about the limits, the things you are able to do and you are not able to do in this power. So I'm saying, when you are pushing, it is important that you prepare our people sufficiently so that they will be able to withstand a backlash. The Cubans were able to withstand a backlash from 1960 up until now for over half a century. But the many things that are happening in South Africa suggest that some of our people will not you know, tolerate the absence of any electricity just for three days. So it is important to mobilize, to deepen mobilization, to prepare our people psychologically, mentally, to appreciate that some of the revolutionary things we are calling for are going to lead to a bitter set, uh, uh, backlash and could result in serious setbacks. People must be prepared to withstand, to organize, to push forward around those. That is very important. To this extent, there are some, I must say, one of the weaknesses, major weaknesses facing the left and which is what I changed my strategy to read here. One of the major weaknesses facing the left is, is inner fighting, is internal fighting. You convene left platforms. When you arrive at the left platform, SACP these, ANAC these, ASAPO these, uh, COSA to this, SAF to this, NUMSA this, no one talks about the party of monopoly capital here, the DA. You, 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 in fact, there are some left so-called left who spent much of their time and energy criticizing other left organizations seeking alternatives. They do not even give us a perspective and analysis of capitalism, its NGOs, its uh, so-called civil society organizations and its trenches and capacities and capabilities. It will be a sad day if we live here without analyzing the, uh, the right. The SACP, the reason why I'm not going to respond 
to the many things that have been said about the SACP here is that as the Vanguard Party, it must be able to absorb criticism. And I do listen, I do hear you, comrades, but I'm criticizing you. I want a perspective. You see, when we deal with the balance of forces and you are discussing the right, I want us to say this is the right wing. Just as Tony Blair was the right wing in the Labour Party and deepened neoliberalism. And at that time, we could not say Labour Party this or support it. The reason why we support it is because of the changes internally that occurred in the Labour Party, giving us the more progressive Jeremy Corbyn. I we saying the same is impossible about the ANC? I will argue not. But the future will tell us. And again, I do accept that we must go broader as the SACP has decided to go broader. But in going broader, we must, you are not going to be able to go broader, Comrade Garnett. I think uh, my uh, Comrade Dinga, who I consider to be one of my mentors, I, I have a high regard for him and I will, I just postponed my flight because I want to listen to him. One of the things he said to me last night was talking about polite politics. I can tell you, if you were to come to, you were in the SACP, you were with me, yourself, in the Young Communist League, by the way. <laughs> if, 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 you were, you, if you are to enter the Central Committee of the Communist Party, with your input structured in that manner, I'm telling you the outcome is not going to be what you want. Because you are going to push the party and say, defend yourself. And I can tell you, if there is one thing we can do, that is that, to defend the party. All right. So, minute, sorry. so the left must avoid the erroneous mistakes that we have pointed out from Lenin. In this regard, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Demzala Numalo, Center for the Study of South African Society for organizing this platform. I am appealing to the center, please, let this be not yet another event. It is rare in South Africa to bring different strands of the left together to reflect on the context and the way forward. Let this become long-term and deep going and emerge at the end of the day in line with the views of Mzala as a vehicle for the left to forge a common, even if it is a minimum program to move forward. There are several policy considerations that have been put forward. I agree with Comrade Garnett. The issue of our mineral resources is very serious. We have moved it under the control of the state, but the state is controlling these mineral resources in the interest of the mining houses that export these mineral resources as raw materials to create jobs in Britain, in the US, and elsewhere. We must see these mineral resources as a strategic advantage to localize the production of finished products local. And linked with this are the issues of expanding education, particularly through a decisive advance of the rollout, progressive rollout of free education for children from working class and poor households who cannot afford to pay university fees. I'm a strong pro proponent that the children of billionaires must pay. Yes, they must. I'm a strong proponent for that. And thank you, I was, I was detained on the 29th of October, uh, on the 29th of April, going to attend the launch of your Communist Party in Zimbabwe. And when you, are, when you introduce yourself, you know, the flashbacks of that detention and in one day interrogation came back, you know. And this is also very important because it, it talks to what you mean by the left in Africa, not just in South Africa. Because we can arrive at the gathering and that party that is in charge there defines itself as the, uh, 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 as the left. We must develop national production. Comrades, in conclusion, comrades, we must fight or we must do whatever we could to develop national production. Without production, there can be no human society. We are not animals. This is what makes, distinguishes us from other categories of animals, if ever we are. The problems of unemployment, inequality, and poverty are not going to be resolved. And in conclusion to you, my comrade, I'm in the alliance. I know a capitalist coming to us telling us to fight the so-called white monopoly capital because this person wants to build black monopoly capital. 
To us, the problem is monopoly capital. If the problem is the bourgeoisie, the problem is the bourgeoisie. It doesn't matter whether they are pink or yellow or black. OK, bye-bye. That's a good place to end. A good place to end. Um, now, Derek is, is, is going to be very cross with me because we're uh, t seriously over time. But shall we take a few, few country? You, you tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we, we have 10 minutes of questions and we carry on. And obviously, the whole discussion will carry on into this, this, the session after lunch. Um, so, OK, uh, John over here. I just want to um, uh, respond to what Garnet said in the beginning of his talk. You know. um, uh, the position that international capitalism is in meltdown well, I can't say if it's true or not at the moment, but I, I must warn against that, uh, that idea, because capitalism has proved to be incredibly resilient over the years. Marx was predicting the imminent downfall of capitalism. Uh, people did it with the First World War, with the Russian Revolution, with the Great Depression in the 30s. Every time, capitalism's about to end with World War II and the growth of socialism in Eastern Europe, social democracy in Western Europe, and the Chinese Revolution at that time. The decolonization movement, the military defeat of the United States by a small country, Vietnam, uh, the emergence of neoliberalism, then 2008 economic crisis. But every time, capitalism has adjusted. It's come out of it. It's very resilient. Now, I'm saying this not to say that capitalism is good, but just to warn us that um, this kind of determinism, it can disarm the left. Uh, it can make us think that the collapse of capitalism is inevitable, and therefore we don't have to do a lot about it. Uh, and so, <clears throat> I mean, what we do need to do is to look at the, capitalist, uh, capital, the weaknesses of capitalism and say, OK, these are the weaknesses. How do we tackle it on the basis of those weaknesses and, and have our own program in, in, in response? Thanks. Why capitalism, whenever it faces a crisis, is able to reinvent itself? The second question is, why socialism is unable, whenever capitalism faces a crisis, why socialism is unable to take advantage of this crisis? So I'm not expecting any answer to this particular question. I think that the gentleman has already talked about particular question, to this particular question. This is what we need to you know, apply our mind to. And until such time we find an answer to this particular question, socialism will never arrive. We never imagine. Um, now, another question is, is My question is, is the weakening of the left forces an admission that it ran out of ideas to envision a new society? I think I'm sure it is uh, Garnett who talked about this issue of the weakening of, of the left. My, 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 my question is, is that, uh, is that an admission uh, that the left has ran out of ideas to envision a new society? Because I, I, I submit that a moment you know, the left forces become weakened, uh, become unable to envision a new, a new society, uh, you know, then it won't be in a position uh, to provide you know, leadership to the society. Uh, now, I just want to make a comment on the issue of the objective reality. Uh, I think it's, it's very important that uh, we should not make a mistake uh, you know, to view political will not as part of the objective reality. Uh, there are two elements that constitute objective reality. Uh, actually, three. The subjective factors uh, which constitute part of the political will 
and objective factors which are structural in nature uh, uh, and leadership. Now, you see, this in my view constitute what I consider as the objective reality. Because you can't have a situation where we are sitting with a political leadership which is capable you see, of, 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 of becoming the vanguard you see, and to lead society out of a particular crisis into a particular direction. So leadership is an objective, it's, it's a subjective factor which manifests itself in concrete, concretely as an objective reality. So is the political will. You see, the fact that we are sitting in this particular crisis post-1994. Comrade, post you can have to wind up. Sorry. Oh, OK. Thank you. Your discipline. Okay. <laughs> um, come in with this check shirt. I, I just want to make a comment, but surely maybe we'll get it to Bob Garnett in Aputo. So it's all Um I've been listening patiently, um, but my problem is on the view that um, the leftist, I think, are in a crisis. On which basis? that we as young people or the, the new generation, we find it hard to find a clear socialist that we can say we can look up to for the politics and what we've been seeing around. You find that for one to understand the ideas of Marx, Engels, you know, socialist society struggles, it has become a status for one, if you understand such ideas, it gives you a certain status. But there is, I feel that there is a lack of clear comrade to, of committed individuals to these ideas. And what does that say to those who are still coming? I'm very worried there. Um, because judging on what is happening, if I clear comrade speaking socialist language today, speaking that capitalism must be crushed, but to follow a comrade to find that somehow is blending around capitalism views and practice. But theoretically, a comrade is a socialist and clear one. So it's a worry to us who are still coming and who are very ready and prepared to take on and move forward. On the issue of, I want to, oh, well, if I forgot the name from SACP, in fact, I was coming to the question of the issue of white monopoly and what is happening. Because the, the reality of the matter is that there is a coming wave of black nationalism. And it is true that it has uh, captured the ideas of many of my generation. Hence, you find while we are saying white monopoly must fall, it seems like we've forgotten. It seems like some people are pushing it in a verge of saying it must be replaced by black elite monopoly. And maybe what can be the view, or what are your views regarding such? Because I think it's an issue we are forgetting as much as we say white monopoly must fall. And yet, from 22 years since democracy we have achieved it, we have just seen a few number of black people making it. For instance, the NYTA in my community have never met a person who was assisted by it. Few individuals. We are creating another class that is black, but that is owning. And yet they are becoming the capitalist. And on the view that they are black, I'm very worried. So maybe just your view on the issue of white monopoly and with the Guptas in the plate. Because you find these issues, and it's very difficult to rely on the media in these moments. Because you watch what AN7 said, you watch ENCA. But today I'm very hopeful that I'll be clarified. Thank you very much. <laughs> you see, my comrades, I will, I know sometimes prescribing classics could be boring. I will prescribe chapter four of Capital Volume One of Karl Marx to you. For you, just to look at the definition of capital and the formula of capital and the decisive statements that Marx make when he talks about capital in its appearance in the form of man. And those who personify capitals, calling them capitalists, and I think there is a confusion between those. The, you know, the confusion between capital and capitalists. Okay? 
Some people would like to tell us that capitalists are capital. Okay, hence the notions of white monopoly capital and so on. Okay, so don't be surprised when that doesn't come from the SACP. You must be happy because we study, we appreciate this thing. We look at it. There is capital and there are capitalists. Capitalists are those who personify capital. And in the epistemology of the word, the word evolved to, a, to an extent where capital is made synonymous with capitalists, such as in the same way as labor is made synonymous with workers. Workers deposit their labor into this commodity. It is this labor that is being exchanged by the capitalists to accumulate from profit. Capital, and you want to tell me that is white, comrade. Uh, I'm telling, I'm, I'm responding to those. And the problem, comrades, about this idea of white monopoly capital, we, say we must get into it, define what we mean by capital, and reconcile that with black, white, female, uh, Hindu, or Jewish capital. Okay, reconcile those things. Because there is a problem. During the era of crisis, people tend to become inward. Okay. Some people are pushing for ownership of capital. Some black people are pushing for ownership and capital of capital. And they are making use of this notion to mobilize the working class on the basis of the color of their skin, simply because they are black. Therefore, it will be better to have the Johannesburg Stock Exchange owned by black but black capitalists. Let me give you an example. And I will, I'm sorry not to respond to the rest. President Jacob Zuma in his State of the Nation address says, as the starting point of radical economic transformation, we are going to enact regulations requiring big companies that take tenders with the state to cede 30% of their contracts to black contractors. I say, what? Well, from a labor perspective, there is a problem. This is radical. And I think about my conditions as a worker who has been outcontracted to a black company owner. And I'm asking, Myself, if I had the phone number of the president, I will tell him, in conclusion, that being radical would have been to give that 30% to the collective ownership of the workers who produce the wealth accumulated by those capitalists. And then to progressively increase it from 30%, 40, 50, until we reach to socialism. That is what will be radical, comrade. Yeah, not black capital. No, 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 comrades, <clears throat> uh, just a, a brief comment on, on, on white monopoly capital. I think the concept has legitimacy, uh, but uh, the concept has limitations. That's the point that I was making. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's also wrong to say it doesn't exist in the literature of the party because we'll give you documents. No, it does. It's there, you know? I was, I, I was, I was, no, no, as white mono, in, in the wedding, I was reviewing uh, SSCP's literature on radical economic transformation. Their major intervention of 2015 has that wedding a white monopoly capital. But, but that's, that, that's not my main thing. My main thing is, is on, Karl Marx and crisis of capitalism. I think Karl Marx actually was proven right by the real history, how it evolved. Because he basically says, capitalism suffers from an aggregate demand. You know, uh, it's a system predicated on capital accumulation, uh, and, and yet that accumulation depends on people buying those products. You know, but people can buy so much and no further. So, so demand is limited, but supply is, is not limited in capitalism because it is predicated on that. So, so that's why it plunges into crisis. And it did plunge into a crisis of uh, a disequilibrium that was very big in the 30s, the crunch. I mean, so, so and even the solutions. That, that were proposed were not market solutions. The, the World War literally saved capitalism. 
there, there's no market that saved capitalism. So in as much as we should caution uh, that, and, and I didn't say, I, 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 okay, let, let me say this. We, we must also not um, eternalize the resilience of capitalism. Capitalism is essentially a historical system that is very young, 1800, you know, 220 something years. It's not a very old system. Or how, uh, did I count correctly? You know, it's not a very old system. Uh, 16th century mercantile, but industrial capitalism, the one were, you know, later, 1800, you know. So it's, and, and for most of the time it has been in crisis, and its crises have not been the same. So what, what I was attempting to do was to chronicle the crisis of capitalism, was not to provide a theory that, no, 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 because it's bad, it's going, no. I was saying that, that there is no runaway industry. Even, even mainstream economists are saying it's a stagnation. Their brains are locked. Uh, no, no, comrade, I didn't say the, the left has ran out of ideas. I'm saying the left is weak. That's the starting point we should move from. Uh, it should be strengthened, you know? And in strengthening the left, we should try to bring about unity in diversity. In strengthening the, the left, we should try to build strong mass organizations so that the initiative by the people finds expression in our socialist logic. Isn't it that as socialists, we're the most democratic, you know, a tendency in society, you know? So, so let's, let's, let's build democracy as we push for social progress. That should be our... A concept of linking democracy with social progress. That's why our South African democracy has not been that good because it has not resulted in a lot of uh, social progress for black people. Uh, yes, monopoly capital restructured, but the neoliberal policies we implemented helped the, the, that restructuring. It did not happen in vacuum. Capitalism can't happen without a state. And, and it's, it's about time that the state imposes its power over capital. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, comrades. Um, so now we have uh, lunch to reflect. <laughs>